Cutting the last twig from the tree with scissors, the young girl with pink hair stretched, wondering aloud what she had been working on all day. She was tired and was about to leave, when suddenly the tree behind her began to taunt her with cries of nothing cutting it. When she heard this, the girl immediately put her huge scissors threateningly against the trunk, promising that if he yelled again, she would cut it off. The tree obeyed. Grudgingly shaking her hands off the dirt, she thought with a disgruntled face that she'd had enough of this. The beautiful woman crouched under a tree to rest, but suddenly remembered that she had been living in this place for 19 years. Her name is Shirabi, and she died 19 years ago. Her name used to be Li Ji Hyon. She was an ordinary student who was just taking the university entrance exam. From her past life, Shirabi recalls walking home from school and looking at her English test results on her phone. But suddenly, she hears another student crying because she failed the exam and will not be able to enter the university. Her friends, who have gathered around her, reassure her that this time the exams were harder, so the passing score should be lower. But the student does not stop crying. Ji Hyun didn't pay attention and walked further across the street. She is saddened that because of the stupid education system, children have to sweat for good grades. As suddenly, the girl notices on the edge of the roof of the building the very student who failed the exam. One man at the foot of the building tries to stop her. Ji Hyun is worried for the girl's life, so he yells at her not to do it. Shirabi herself regrets interfering at that time. She, arms outstretched toward her, encourages the suicidal woman that the final results have not yet been released, and it is foolish to jump to conclusions. The protagonist does not understand whether she did so out of moral principles or out of a sense of justice. In tears, the girl on the roof says that if her parents find out the results of the exam, terrible things will happen to her. Ji Hyun assures her that everything will be fine. Hoping to talk some sense into the girl, she says she goes to the same school as her, bringing the embroidered name on her uniform as proof. Eventually, the suicidal girl hears a suggestion from her classmate to just go down and talk, to which she agrees. But suddenly her foot slips, causing the girl to fall down from the roof. At this moment, Ji Hyun, without knowing why herself, felt that she had to save this person. She cried out desperately, fearing for her life. The girl tore forward and stretched her arms forward, hoping to catch the suicidal girl who was about to touch the asphalt. However, she overestimated her abilities. The body flying downward crushed the rescuer herself, from which she said goodbye to her life. This was Shirabi's last memory from her past life. She sighs heavily and says that everything is useless. She gets up from the ground, while the plant barrages her with questions about whether she will still be cutting branches. The girl politely asks the tree to be quiet. Shirabi was reborn in a certain empire called Ventria, a very popular fantasy world where everyone is born with some sort of ability. The more this force is developed, the more powerful it will be, and the best in their field will be invited to serve the emperor. The main character's ability to hear what the plants are saying. She developed it constantly, and as a result became a recognized gardener. Shirabi ran to the house, opened the door, and right on the doorstep she collapsed on the floor from exhaustion. But suddenly, she notices a strange movement in the room, from which she rises and asks if there is anyone here but her. The gardener notices a handsome young brunette that keeps his eyes on her. The guy, whose legs are slightly see-through, takes a seat next to the stranger and asks if she can really see him. Shirabi feels as if she's swallowed her tongue. She doesn't know who's in front of her, and she feels as strange as when she talks to plants. But the girl realizes that this stranger could be anyone, so she decided to defend herself. She threw berries from her pouch right in his face. The boy cried out from the pain on his forehead where the berry had hit, and the gardener thought she had managed to overpower the uninvited guest. The young man began to resent the protagonist for spreading her arms, and like a ghost, approached her again. She was even more frightened than before, and again threw berries at the stranger. Some time passes, Shirabi and the guy calm down and decide to talk peacefully at the table, but the girl still reminds him that it's all his fault. After getting nothing in response from the other, Shirabi finally decides to ask at least the stranger's name. The boy indifferently says his name is Pierre, to which the gardener resents him, saying his name is too strange and asks him to say his real Korean name. Shibari, showing an example on himself, affectionately introduces himself by the name Lee Hyun, then sternly asks to repeat exactly the same. Pierre interjects about the Korean name, and the girl says she can't understand why it's so hard for him to say it. The young man admits that he has good reasons for not giving his real name. Noticing the very bag of berries on the table, he apologizes to Shirabi so that those berries don't fly to his face again. The girl accepts the apology and takes the pouch closer to her, 
She asks Pierre if he is a man or a spirit. The boy wanted to answer, but she interrupted him, reasoning that he couldn't be a ghost, since she could see him and touch him. Eventually, Shirabi asks if he is a living tree spirit, to which he readily agrees, clarifying that he is a spirit with amnesia. Pierre wanted to ask that she take care of him, but the gardener suddenly rose from her seat and with a sigh said she was wasting her time and left. The protagonist decided to continue with her usual gardening endeavors. Pierre finds her, approaches her, and asks her what she does. She gives the obvious answer. She works. The guy notices the branches that Shirabi puts in the pots and says he thought the branches would die if you cut them off. The gardener says with a pleasant smile that if the branch is cut by someone else, it will die. But if she does, it won't. Suddenly, Pierre hears something strange. A girl asks one sapling to wake up soon because tomorrow it will go to a new good master. Suddenly, the sapling sleepily says he wants to sleep some more, which shocks the guy who is hearing plant voices for the first time. Shirabi decides to use magic on the plant, which transforms an ordinary dry twig into a beautiful green bush. Upon seeing this, a startled Pierre warily asks what this place is and who she is. The girl tells him to read the sign outside the house. After reading the sign, Shirabi Flower Garden, the guy instantly remembered that he was standing next to the Ventria Empire's best gardener. The young man says that with such strong abilities, the protagonist could work in the Imperial Palace and asks why she's still here. Shirabi says she gets job invitations every week, but her small store is her favorite. The girl adds that she is not driven to work in a palace with a strict routine. She earns more when she works for herself. Staring at the sun, the gardener decided that while they waited for the rain, they would take a break. Shirabi quickly gets Pierre up to speed by handing him a pot with a bush and tells him not to be afraid and not to stand there. The guy clumsily picks up the pot, which really made the girl laugh like a pro. The gardener wistfully notes that her new friend doesn't look like a spirit, not even noticing that he isn't reflected in the window. At that moment, the girl is called by someone from behind, so she has to switch her attention from the guy to the customer. But instead of greeting the customer, Shirabi suddenly grabbed Pierre's arm and ran into the house with him. Leaving the sign on the door that said closed, the girl hid behind the closet, ordering the guy to be quiet. He was still trying to ask her what was going on, since no one could hear him anyway. The customer, who turned out to be an elegant old man, was desperately trying to get through to the store owner. He says the problem he came in with can only be handled by her and promises to first double and then triple the fee to solve it. The gardener, hearing the clinking of coins, immediately opens the door for the customer, apologizing for such a long wait. The rogue escorts the guest into the store with an adorable smile and apology. Pierre clearly didn't expect to see such a brazen money-making scheme from such a sweet girl. After organizing himself a cup of tea, Shirabi interrogates the old man about what his problem is that he is willing to pay triple the price for. The client, having laid out a map on the table, points his finger at a mountain. The girl says that it will be a difficult climb and asks what happened there. The old man says that on this mountain is the almost completely burned-down mansion of a high-ranking man. The gardens around it are in a terrible state. My uncle claims that nothing grows there. Even weeds are rare. He wonders if all this can be restored. Hearing from the girl that burned plants are difficult to restore, the grandfather was not on a joke. The man, greatly saddened, asked if this meant that nothing could be undone now. Shirabi replied that anything was possible, on one condition. Smiling wryly, the girl says that such an operation would cost the old man a very large figure. The grandfather assures the gardener that she doesn't have to worry about money, she just has to agree and name the amount. Hearing such nice words, the protagonist takes a piece of paper and a pen to calculate the price of the service. After some minor calculations in which she took into account the size of the mansion, discounted it, and multiplied everything by three, the number 180 came out. The girl gave the written check to her grandfather. He sighed heavily, but agreed to pay the 180 zlotties. He clarifies if she can complete the task in a month, to which Shirabi replies that she will complete everything in three days. The old man puts an advance of 50 zlotties on the table and promises to pay the rest when he sees the result. After receiving the money, the girl started to send the client out, promising that in three days she would be waiting for him in the store with the rest of the money. After getting rid of the old man, Shirabi sat back down at the table and started counting her money. Pierre decided to wonder how she was going to revitalize an entire garden in three days. His girlfriend replies without an ounce of concern that everything is fine and such a period of time to work is more than enough for her. Tossing the bag of money, the girl said he could come with her if he was so interested, glimpsing that rain was expected today. However, once she was already at the gates of the mansion at night, 
Shirabi no longer felt so confident. She crouched down on the ground out of exhaustion, trying to get her breathing straightened out from having been walking in circles all this time because of the tree replicas. Pierre asks Shirabi the question that was the last straw before her indignation. Why is she angry when she is surely used to hearing trees? The girl complains that he doesn't know anything and that everything would go smoothly if she knew the way. She decides to get down to business and touch the old gate, by which she assumed the events happened quite some time ago. Shirabi walked through them and touched a tree branch, which crumbled into crumbs in her fingers. She says things are worse than she realized and that the fire occurred approximately eight years ago. And this fire was no ordinary fire. Someone had intentionally burned everything with their powers, making it impossible to use healing magic in this place. Going to use magic, Shirabi says he can't restore the forest and that only time, rain and sunlight will help. Pierre wonders what the girl is going to do now, to which the girl, crouching on the ground, says that she is going to rid this place of vile forces. She asks her partner to take care of her if she passes out. Shirabi touched the ground with her palms, after which her power began to take effect. From her hands, the magic along the ground seeped into all the plants and trees, which began to blossom before her eyes. In a matter of seconds, an experienced gardener transformed a long dead forest into a beautiful blooming garden. Pierre could not believe his eyes when he saw the result of Shirabi's work. Rising from the ground, the girl said that she had put in a little more spiritual power than required, after which she lost consciousness. The young man deftly caught her, allowing the sorceress to remain uninjured. Looking at the girl's sleeping face, the boy wondered if she was definitely an ordinary gardener. Night passes. A carriage rides along the road, in which sits an expensively dressed young man and a servant. The gentleman asks why he wants to go to that mountain. His servant tells him not to get so upset about it and advises him to believe the old man for once. Passing a lonely store with a closed sign, the man wanted to tell the gentleman about the changed landscape around the mansion, but decided to keep silent. The young man wanted to ask what it all meant, but the servant waved him off and apologized. The carriage pulled up to the very mansion now covered in grass, studded with flowers and green trees. Looking at all this beauty, the gentleman can't believe his eyes. Touching the trunk of a once-living tree, the man inquires of the servant who was able to bring this garden to life. Slightly embarrassed, the servant wanted to say that it was all thanks to the old man's request, but the master interrupted him. He rudely repeats the question about wanting to know whose hands made the garden so transformed. The latter, noticing that the gentleman is angry, calls the name of the gardener Shirabi, which at once seems familiar to the young man. He remembers almost immediately that this is the same girl who had refused the offer to work in the imperial palace every time. The gentleman also recalls that her personality is often discussed by noble ladies. Keeping in mind that Her Majesty was now carrying his younger brother, the young man ordered a servant to make the same beautiful trees in the imperial garden as well. Looking at the flowers on the branches, the gentleman thought that he would really like someone else to see this beauty, because he would like it. The protagonist, meanwhile, listens to a jolly man in her store. He says that this time she has done something big. Jokingly nudging the famous gardener, who is clearly not happy to see him, he reminds her that today is a fundraising day. Shirabi went on a business trip, much to the man's delight. Pierre, on the other hand, doesn't understand what this fundraiser is all about. The gardener, who loves money, doesn't want to give away her bag with 50 zloty she has recently earned. Very reluctantly, the girl still gives the money to the man, even though Pierre tried to talk her out of it. After counting the coins, the old man said that the interest for that month amounted to 20 zlotties, but he would take all 50 and set off the payment of the debt. The old man leaves the store, reminding the debtor that she has only 2,512 coins left to pay. Shirabi, drowning in tears, looked after him. Wishing the girl that next month she wouldn't have trouble paying the installments either, he slammed the door shut. Immediately, Pierre swooped in with questions about who the man was, why he had taken the money, and what the other debt was. Wiping away tears, Shirabi calmly replies that duty is duty and that there is nothing surprising about it. The young man was surprised to learn that she had borrowed nothing, but was paying off her debts instead of her parent's friend. The girl resents the fact that he doesn't know about the main cliché of dramas, the poor protagonist. He says he doesn't even know what a drama is. Shirabi explains that in the canon, her family lived happily ever after until they became impoverished due to a misconstructed bail bond contract. Next, the girl wanted to tell how she came into the world, but recalled a mute memory from a past life when she died for being suicidal. She realizes that things didn't end well in her previous life, and she's up to her neck in problems in this one. Shirabi says she has to keep making money at all costs, but always ends up with nothing. 
Pierre listened to her in silence the whole time, until he realized that she had fallen asleep so soundly that she didn't even respond to touch. The guy decided to take care of her. He carried the tired lady to the bed and covered her with a blanket. Examining a strand of her hair, the young man goes on a monologue about how hard she's having it and that he's basically going to be another problem for her. After playing with her hair, Pierre wished the girl a good night's rest and sleep. But after two days, his patience breaks down and he wakes Shirabi up loudly, causing her to wake up immediately. But the girl grabbed the blanket back, screaming at the ghost to leave her alone. However, the boy was stronger. He snatched the blanket from the beauty, causing her to fall from the bed to the floor. Pierre proves to Shirabi that she can't sleep any longer. If she continues, she will starve to death. But the girl doesn't seem to hear him, because she's staring at the view from the window, where the sun's rays are shining brightly on her. Afterward, not giving her friend's words much thought, she climbs back onto the bed to continue sleeping. However, Pierre is not satisfied with this. He forbids the girl to continue lying in bed, taking her in his arms. Shirabi did not expect this. The guy brings the gardener to the restroom, sits her in the bathtub and waters her from the shower, and the girl still can't get away from the shock. Pierre interrupted the silence between them, wondering when the protagonist would start washing up already. Blazing with anger, Shirabi takes the shower head from him and kicks him out of the room. The girl assumes that he is crazy. Otherwise, why would he be interested in whether or not she would starve to death? She usually only heard threats from people. At that moment, she notices her reflection in the mirror, in which she saw herself looking sleepy and unkempt. The girl takes up hygiene, wondering aloud at the ugliness she just saw. The girl carried out all her hygiene procedures and left the bathroom. She notices Pierre attending to a potted plant in her place. The girl also notices his feet, which are slightly translucent through and through. With a cup of tea, Shirabi sits down on a chair and tells the guy that he won't get any money for his work, and she has no social benefits either. Pierre does not understand her words, after which the girl says that she is just warning him. But about the exchange, she can give him a roof over his head. The young man asks her if that means she wants to hire him. Shirabi replies that this is generally possible, for it is not at all necessary to feed someone like him. Pierre, however, says that he can eat if he has to, to which the TA says that's unrealistic for a ghost. Hearing the girl's last words, the guy decided to show her something and asked her to give him her hand. Shirabi didn't quite understand what that was about, but reached out her palm to him anyway. Pierre then asked her to turn her attention to the mirror in which both she and he were reflected. The protagonist could not control her emotions and choked on her tea in surprise. The ghost had not expected such a harsh reaction and helped the girl to cough. Coughing but not out of shock, Shirabi asks Pierre about how he did such a stunt. He says he doesn't know either, but he remembers taking the gardener in his arms in the palace garden to carry her to the store. And at that moment, the young man noticed that his leg was not translucent as it had been before. He concluded that by touching Shirabi, it became material. The young man went back to cleaning, and the girl went to look in the mirror. She said she felt as if she had become stronger. She also says that if she uses her abilities until she is completely drained, her threshold is slightly raised. Pierre pays no attention to her words, however, and holding out a towel, offers her a towel to dry her wet hair after her shower. The girl in turn remembers that she's still resentful of him and rejects his help. The guy compares Shirabi to a child and wonders how he got to this point. He complains aloud that he has lived so many years and now has to wipe his girlfriend's hair himself. The girl overhears this and asks about his age. She recalls that Pierre is a spirit and he may be very old. She still asks him such a question. The guy said he was 19, which surprised the gardener because it turns out they were the same age. Pierre was surprised at this fact, to which Shirabi said that she was the one here who should be surprised that the spirit was only 19 years old. He wanted to clarify if the main character was really 19, because according to him, she looks very young. For such expressions, the girl plopped him on the floor and went to open the doors for the incoming customers. When she opened the door, she immediately announced that she would be accepting exclusively 30 people today. After a while, the spirit and the gardener came to a resplendent palace with marvelous landscaping all around. Not noticing no obvious vegetation problems in this place, Pierre asked the obvious question, why did they come here? Shirabi says it's all about the two pillars of business, which are taking care of loyal customers and another taking care of loyal customers. The girl adds that there is a third point, which is also to take care of regular customers. The confused guy says that's what he wants to know. Why the concern? and then says for the record that they have come to the Duke's residence. She then asks about the fact that she had to go to the palace and that a guy named Glam had been here before. 
A crowd has gathered around the gardener's store, shouting out their job offers. One offers to hire him to make cosmetic repairs to a mansion, while the other demands a deadline to renovate a new restaurant. Pierre, leaning against the trunk of a plant, marvels at what he sees, comparing this crowd to a war. But suddenly, no one but him notices a strange glow appearing where he touched the tree. Topla, meanwhile, is dispersed by incoming emperor's envoys, who make their way to Shirabi's store. They were guards for a very noble man who was sent to a talented gardener. After a while, this important person tearfully begs the protagonist to heed his suggestion. He holds out a beautiful pouch with 100 gold pieces to Shirabi, hoping she will at least give her consent that way. Seeing the money, the girl immediately thinks of the moneylender who is so fond of taking money from her. She kicks him out of her thoughts. The gardener didn't even think that the representative of the imperial family himself would come to see her. He was sure he had been sent by the imperial prince. The girl clarifies that if the man came to make her a gardener under the emperor, in that case, the imperial family will manage her. Shirabi says she again refuses such an offer and asks to be left alone. However, the man is not ready to take no for an answer, so he tosses the bag of coins right into the girl's hands. Kneeling down, he says that the prince gave him a direct order to join the gardener to work in the imperial palace. He also says that he asked many imperial gardeners about the tree that Shirabi planted. They all said that this kind of tree did not exist, and the crown prince wants to give his future younger brother a garden with the same tree planted in it. The man admits that Shirabi is a more talented gardener than the current one at the imperial palace. However, the protagonist decides that he just wants to screw her over with work, so she advises him to fool someone else. At the same time, the girl admits that they really can't plant a sapling of that tree and grow it as fast as she did. The drooping man says it's all due to the incompetence of the current imperial gardeners. At that moment, Pierre intervenes. He gently touches Shirabi's shoulder and asks her why she is doing all this. From surprise, the gardener cries out loudly and swears at the guy for scaring her so much. The representative of the imperial family did not understand what had happened and asked what the girl was so frightened about. Shirabi says she just heard a strange sound and decides to return to the topic of conversation. The man asks her how much the service will cost. After setting a price of four gold, the girl says that the prepayment of 104 gold is only 50 gold. Sighing in relief, the man gives her a beautiful necklace and tells her that she can now enter the imperial palace unhindered. He warns that everything she does in the palace will have to be laid out directly to the Lord. Shirabi happily agrees while the man thinks to himself how someone like her could have been accepted into the palace. Leaving the store, the representative of the imperial family reminded the gardener to come by after work and then slammed the door. The girl sat down tiredly in a chair. Pierre poured her a glass of water. Shirabi asks the guy why he wants to enter the imperial palace so badly. Noticing his puzzled expression, she asks about the fact that didn't he want her to become an imperial gardener to get into the palace. Pierre says that he can only do that now with her personal presence. Shirabi, however, twirls her finger negatively. The girl says that the palace is protected by a powerful magical barrier and that you can't get there without permission. She wonders why the guy needs it so much. Hearing nothing in reply, the gardener relaxes with a glass of water, proud that she got the job without too much red tape. Only she doesn't know what to do next. Remembering the very same trick of bringing the forest to life, Pierre asks if she can pull off the same thing she did then, to which Shirabi says that she is afraid of making a mistake, as the crown prince himself wishes to see her. Ironically asking herself why he can't leave her alone, the girl walks away from the table. A guy sits down in her seat and, as if about to start a serious conversation, says that only she can help him with something. Suddenly, the protagonist reappears near him in a different character. She decides that she has no choice and has to go to the palace. Already on her way out the door, she asks Pierre what he is going to do, for she cannot understand him. The girl ordered him not to stand still, but rather to follow her, while the guy wanted to say something to her, but didn't have time. Time returns to the present, where Pierre and Shirabi are standing at the Duke's gate. Everything that had happened before was the reason why the ghost thought they would go to the Imperial Palace. The gardener introduces herself to the guards, whereupon the gate is opened for them. Walking through the lavish courtyard, the girl reminds them that if they want to earn money, they don't have to feel sorry for themselves. The guy says there's no point, since the loan shark will take all the money anyway, to which the gardener tells him not to ruin all the motivation. Shirabi aggressively assures that even if she doesn't have much money, procuring saplings is not a futile endeavor. The girl staggered further toward the palace entrance, resentful of Pierre for saying such things. The ghost, meanwhile, recalls the time he touched a tree trunk and a glow appeared. 
Then the lad heard the tree, after mentioning the man who would be loved by the people, say that he couldn't believe he was still in that shabby shop because of that rumor. Pierre asks the tree spirit about why, if he knows everything, he's not going to say anything to Shirabi. The creature, having crawled out of the tree, says that they cannot interfere in human affairs without the authorization of their direct destiny. The guy wonders if that means he shouldn't ask questions. The spirit reminds us that Pierre has no physical shell and stands between life and death while wanting to be treated as a human being. Watching the gardener, he recognizes the strength of her abilities, even though she is still very young. The entity expresses that there is no person in the entire world that can compare to her, so they should be careful. Pierre does not understand his words, from which the spirit explains that strong people have a harder life and are usually lonely. On behalf of all the tree spirits, the creature says that they would like Shirabi to realize her power as late as possible, thus avoiding danger. Dissolving into thin air, the spirit asks the guy to take care of the girl until he leaves the store for good. He mentions that the gardener has been coping with all the hardships on her own since childhood. They cannot bestow love on her. Only people can do that. As he gazes in the wake of his friend, Pierre realizes that although he listened to the spirit then, he still doesn't know how to help her. In front of the girl, meanwhile, a servant greets her and says that she has heard of Mrs. Shirabi. The gardener is embarrassed and says she should have come earlier, for which she apologizes. The maid, on the contrary, says that she should thank the protagonist for such care. She brings the couple to the imperial garden, after which she asks Shirabi to take care of his beauty. Having cheerfully set to work, the girl brags that she has already earned as much as four gold pieces. Pierre says it looks like a regular tree care job and asks if she does it to get quality branches. He also adds that the gardener can now move freely between the residence and the imperial palace. Suddenly, Shirabi hears words that make him tongue-tied. The guy thinks it's stupid to invite a thief like her to the imperial palace. She says it's just that her skills are very good and asks the young man to bring a stepladder, which he immediately complies. Deftly climbing the stepladder and branches, the girl finds herself high up in a tree. Pierre warns her not to fall, to which Shirabi tells him to get ready to catch her. The girl's last words made the boy blush. He replayed them in his head while the gardener continued her work. But the girl, seeing his idleness, made him come out of his fantasies and continue gathering branches. Finished with her business, Shirabi jumped down from the tree, preparing to move on to the next one. But suddenly, she notices a completely dry tree. The girl can't understand what happened to it and why it is in such a state. Using her magic, she tries to help the tree, but no word is heard from the tree. Pierre wonders if the tree is dead, to which the gardener replies in the negative because she can slightly sense his spirit energy. She keeps trying to talk to the tree, but it's to no avail. But suddenly, the protagonist has a brilliant idea, and she asks Pierre to hand her an axe. Thoth thought she wanted to chop something off the plant and was just about to run an errand, but realized he couldn't take the axe in his hand. Pierre is confused that for unknown reasons, in addition to his leg, his arm has become translucent. Shirabi got tired of waiting and picked up the tool herself, calling the guy useless because he can't handle such small things. The girl staggered toward the tree, while an offended Pierre kept saying that he wasn't useless at all, as she thought. The gardener, meanwhile, without any sympathy on her face, swung her axe right at the dried-up imperial plant. It was at that moment that the tree ordered the girl to stop. Fortunately, the blade had no time to damage him. Shirabi moves the axe away from the frightened tree, expressing her joy at being able to get it to talk. The girl says that was her last warning, and next time there won't be a stump left of him. After analyzing the tree, which could not have suffered so much from disease or lack of nutrition, the gardener orders him to tell the whole truth. The couple was perplexed when it turned out that the tree was so damaged due to the child's prank and stress. When Pierre wondered about the stress in the trees, Shirabi was also taken aback that he didn't know they had that. The guy doesn't understand how a five-year-old could do such a thing to a tree, while the girl says it's quite possible. She names a species of tree, ginkgo, the gardener says it likes to be treated with respect. The ghost wonders if there is any connection between the kind of tree and the character of its spirit. But instead of answering, Shirabi remarks that he knows nothing at all about her new partner. Ginkgo biloba is a species of tree that does not exist in this world. After opening the store three, four years ago, she wanted to attract customers with them. Then she went around to all the wealthiest families in the state and planted one such tree in their gardens. In her past life in Korea, they could be found everywhere, they are sturdy and adapt to everything, also pleasing to the eye. Given that the tree is kind and human-like, Shirabi suggests calling it Count or King so it won't get upset. 
The girl says she'll report everything to the owners of the lot anyway, but reminds the plant that she's the one who planted it and grew it. Tree apologizes to her, and she decides that they have come to a common understanding. After that, the protagonist proceeds to heal the tree as she wanted to do in the beginning. Thanks to the magic of a talented gardener, wilted branches regrow gorgeous young foliage in no time. Night has fallen. Shirabi, being already in her store, shakes off her hands after a long work in which she had harvested as many as 100 seedlings. Pierre says she's very generous, and it will be more than enough for the imperial family. The woman, taking the cart with seedlings to the street, agrees and says that some of them can be planted near their house. The guy catches up with her and wonders why the girl is doing this particular thing in the middle of the night. The girl replies that there are many people in the palace during the day, and she wants to avoid unnecessary stares. She doesn't want to look strange talking to the trees. At the same time, she says that other people's attention can be helpful if you suddenly pass out. Passers-by will be able to help. And last time, dealing with burned trees was much more difficult and energy-consuming than this one, in which you just have to plant saplings. Pierre is tormented by another question. What is wrong with the very axe that the protagonist always takes with her? Shirabi says that it is made of soft material, but if you make an effort, you can chop down trees with it. She bought it for three gold pieces. For her, it is very useful as it helps her threaten spirits and chop wood. She cites a recent incident with a ginkgo spirit as an example. Her partner asked if that meant she was just chopping down trees for them, to which she menacingly replied that she was not. Pierre hadn't expected such an outburst of emotion from the girl, so he thought he'd said something wrong. Shirabi, on the other hand, says that humans and spirits are not the same. Evil can settle in a person's heart, and it can also leave. Spirits aren't like that at all. Their emotions may not change for a lifetime unless someone makes it happen. The girl reiterates to the guy, just in case, that she doesn't chop down trees just for fun. Dragging the cart again, the gardener expresses her joy at seeing Pierre looking more like a human than a spirit. That one, remembering the spirit's words that only a man can give love to a man, hurried to catch up with his friend. The day comes. Shirabi grudgingly tells the palace knights to stop, thanks them for their work, and asks them to pretend they don't know it. She grabs a few saplings and walks away from the men, who don't understand what the girl is suddenly so angry about. Her partner decides to inquire as to what caused the girl to feel so emotional. After all, Pierre had noticed the change in her mood as soon as she entered the imperial estates. Shirabi says her mood was destined to be ruined because she saw the mess in the newly built garden. Boiling with anger, she blames it on the imperial gardeners, who should have removed the rocks, dust, and lime from the garden. Guy recalls that a friend once said she was at odds with the imperial gardeners. Based on this, he asks why they are so dismissive of her. Examining the dust, Shirabi says he doesn't know, and assumes they got here too early and didn't have time to clean everything up. However, the girl assures that they should clean up the mess, because you can't plant trees in such polluted soil. She tilts her head straight up to the soil and asks nature to help her clean the earth, delighting her by bringing her little friends. A magical fairy immediately responds to the request for help, which in turn asks the wind to help her. Together, they willingly sweep away all the rocks, sticks, dust, and other dirt from the emperor's garden. A few seconds later, the ground was cleared, making the palace seem to glow with new colors. Shirabi, seeing such beauty, declared admiringly that she was now in the mood to work. Pierre, watching the girl, begins to feel strange. This happens whenever she uses her power. His face and neck are covered with a blush, from which it is evident that the nature of the feeling has romantic traits. However, the gardener, noticing the guy busy doing something he didn't understand, accused him of shirking his work. Toth became even more embarrassed and urged his friend to ignore him, but he couldn't stop Shirabi, who came right up to his face, gazing intently. After that, the girl leaves without saying a word, and the guy exhales in relief. After a while, the gardener finished her work by planting a not insignificant number of saplings. As she evaluates her work, the girl thinks about what color wood would go well with the design of the palace. She thinks about the color pink, but immediately discards it. Suddenly, a man appears from behind and interrogates the employee about what color she thinks would be a perfect match. Turning around, Shirabi sees an expensively dressed gentleman, she guessed that he might be one of the emperor's executives. The gentleman gets tired of the protagonist's silence, so he interrogates her about the color. Suddenly, the gardener admits that instead of planting new trees, it would be better to decorate the ones already in the garden with flowers. The gentleman wondered if that meant the girl didn't want to plant new trees. Shirabi, drenched in sweat, says that she thinks it is best to plant only half of the saplings. She herself ponders who the stranger might be. 
Suddenly she goes off the topic of conversation and asks the man who he is. The Lord was at first surprised at this, and then laughed at such a silly question. His answer surprised the girl even more. She would soon learn his name, but in the meantime, he asked her to decorate the palace as she saw fit. The man remembered that the person in front of him was the same gardener who had recently rebuilt the burned garden. At that moment, Shirabi guesses that it is the crown prince. However, the prince sets a condition. He wants the rose tree from the garden to be here too. The Lord continued to say something to Shirabi, but she didn't hear him because she was thinking about how annoyed she was by this encounter. But she immediately thought of the benefit to her side. Working for such a wealthy family, she must make a lot of money. Based on these thoughts, she makes the statement that if the crown prince changes the working conditions, the price of services will increase. Also, the girl says that instead of large trees, it will be appropriate to plant small flower beds here. But working with flowers is not her main specialty, so she will charge extra for harvesting and moving new seedlings. The prince agrees and promises to convey all the terms to the treasurer, which brings a satisfied smile to the gardener's face. As he was leaving Shirabi, the gentleman said he was eager to see what a beautiful garden she would make for him. She bowed to him. Once the crown prince left, she allowed herself to let her emotions of joy spill outward. But suddenly she is distracted by Pierre saying that she has done well. The girl asks him what he means. The guy says that when you meet someone with a higher status than you, you immediately get nervous, and that's normal. But instead, Shirabi bargained with the crown prince himself, which makes the guy feel slightly embarrassed. Filling the watering can with water, the girl says there is nothing wrong with that because she is not afraid of anything. But at the same moment, she begins to doubt, because according to her, fears come in many forms. Hearing this, Pierre decides to ask his friend to tell her what her fears are. In response, she said with a very somber face that the thing she was most afraid of was the money ghost. Shirabi changes the subject and says that the crown prince's visit is a little strange because he is known to be a busy man. Pierre also ponders that surely the prince doesn't think he's anything special, since this is the first time he's ever seen a person of imperial blood behave like this. Some time passes. The gardener is busy working, scattering seeds on the ground. Her friend notices this, and with a disgruntled face asks the girl to pay attention to him. She responds, whereupon Pierre grimly reminds her that she charges extra for the purchase and transportation of the seedlings, which is not the case now. Suddenly, Shirabi says that she lied about all this for money, which again makes the guy feel ashamed for his friend. Looking at the seeds scattered on the grass, Pierre wonders what she's going to do, since they're just ordinary seeds. The gardener assures that the species is easier to change and gives the example of a rose tree that does not exist in their world. She admits that there is one problem, which is the architecture of this palace, and because of this, she can't find the right flowers to match the design. Pierre is surprised, because he thought Shirabi already knew in advance what kind of flowers she wanted. The girl says she has some options, but there are so many that she doesn't even know what to choose. She decides to ask Pierre if he has any ideas. He is deep in thought. But suddenly they are distracted by a voice coming from nearby that calls insistently for Shirabi. The girl immediately guesses that it's the trees asking for attention. The pair moved closer to a tall tree, which happens to have an opinion about the flower bed. After listening to his suggestion, the gardener promised that she would heed it. A day passes. The palace garden is now adorned with a meadow of flowers and many rose trees. This beauty is admired by knights, servants, and the crown prince's personal messenger alike. Shirabi with a satisfied smile admires the work done and presents the gentleman with the new garden. The prince, looking at the flowers, also marvels at the garden that has been so transformed in such a short time. Recalling that this is a garden for a child, the gardener praises the white flowers, a color that symbolizes innocence. In addition, they go perfectly with the pink trees. At this moment, the girl is being watched by the Lord's messenger. He recognizes her ability to surprise. He marvels at the fact that Shirabi, unlike other gardeners, has made many never-before-seen plants bloom at once. The man even thinks that the main character's abilities go beyond common sense. He has no idea what kind of trees the gardener has planted, and he's sure no one else knows but her. Eventually, he wonders where she gets so many saplings of a tree that is unknown to the world. Gently touching Shirabi's shoulder, the prince's envoy praises her for such a splendid result, though there are still a few things left to do in the garden. At this time, the crown prince is distracted by the pink petal that fell right beside his foot. After examining it closer, the gentleman wonders aloud how small they are and how many there are. Shirabi and the messenger turn around at the sound, as if they have heard something amazing. Suddenly, the crown prince approaches the gardener with a proposition. 
whether she would like to continue working in the Imperial Palace. At first the girl was angered by his words, but pulling herself together, she politely reminded him that she had already rejected the offer more than once. Examining the petal, the prince wonders why she does not consent. In response, the gardener similarly repeats that she has already explained the reason many times. The gentleman says that her words did not reach him, after which he politely asks her to explain herself. She sighs heavily and asks the messenger how much money will be spent on the toll this time. He says about four gold pieces. Next, Shirabi asks about what the salary of the imperial gardeners is. The man says it is fifteen gold pieces a month. The girl confesses that every time she goes to mine new plant species, she pays a tax of four gold, and it only costs her four times to go plant shopping. The costs outweigh her paycheck. Taking her watering can, the girl says that this is the end of her work, after which she walks away from the men. But suddenly she decides to go back to the crown prince and remind him about the extra payment for his services, which is twenty-five gold pieces. Pierre, who saw this brazen behavior of his friend, almost fell under the ground with shame. He asks the girl if she has a drop of conscience and fear left in her soul, to which Shirabi says that nothing will happen to her, as she has said it before. She just wants to make money. The girl recalls that she has vivid memories from her past life, where she lived for nineteen years but was never able to fit into society. The gentleman's next words surprise the gardener not a little. He offers her a salary of one hundred gold pieces. According to him, so she can become an imperial gardener without a loss to herself and take care of the imperial family's garden. Suddenly, Shirabi irritably covers her face with her palm and sighs heavily. She, apologizing to his majesty in advance for her rudeness, says that the cost of the work in his garden will be at least 140 gold pieces. The girl also adds that even a salary of 100 gold would not be enough for an imperial gardener, and lastly says that she doesn't have that much free time to tend to the Lord's garden. On this basis, Shirabi concludes that she has to decline, but if the prince needs her services, she is willing to perform individual tasks. After all that was said, the girl glanced at Pierre, who was clearly acting as if he wanted to discourage her. The gardener was about to leave, contemplating whether the lord would risk offering her the position again after his personal rejection. But suddenly, she hears from the prince completely shocking words. He offers to increase her salary by five hundred gold pieces. His Majesty reminds us that no one but he has the right to decide what salary an imperial gardener is worthy of. Mr. Counts on Shirabi's agreement, which puts her in an even more shocking situation. Also, the prince makes a promise that he will also pay for all the additional expenses of the girl. The gardener, however, was so surprised at what was happening that she wondered if it was all suspicious, and she couldn't have been so lucky. She wanted to say she was refusing again, but the gentleman beat her to it, saying she couldn't do that. He explains that if she refuses again, she will disrespect the imperial family, and he will accuse her of disloyalty. Shirabi falls to the ground hopelessly, not understanding why God has given her such a punishment and what is wrong with this prince. His Majesty, after surveying the beauty around him, again prays the talented gardener for her work. Already at home, the exhausted protagonist says that she wants to leave the country, to which Pierre says that it is necessary to know a foreign language. The guy assures the girl that if she agrees, all avenues will be open to her. Besides, this is not an ordinary event, but an international one. Shirabi pounds her fist on the table and says that's exactly why she doesn't want to do it. She is talking about some event that is considered very important. The girl admits that she can't stand it. The gardener is sure that if she tries her best, she will have even more detractors. Pierre wonders to his friend about whether she has such a bad relationship with the imperial gardeners. Shirabi says that's not really true. In fact, she's just too lazy to put herself out there and do a lot of chores. The girl admits that she understands the feelings of those gardeners, as she herself is the owner of a garden. Pierre, on the other hand, says that it's not quite right for the main character to compare herself to them. Suddenly, the guy asks Shirabi to pay attention to the door where someone has been knocking on it for a long time. The gardener says she is aware of this and that she has put a closed sign on the door, which the stranger ignores. Taking a deep breath, the girl still decides to go and open the door for this persistent customer. Pierre was getting worried at this point. He thought it would be a good idea to keep an eye on his friend and find out who had come to see them. Opening the door of the store, Shirabi saw in front of her a cute little girl with big eyes. Glowing with a smile, the little girl politely asked the saleswoman for a single flower. If it were an adult, the gardener would slam the door in his face. But this is a child, so she decides to keep her cool. She just as politely replies to the girl that she is not in the business of growing flowers and recommends that she go to another store. 
but the child does not think of leaving, as she is told that Shirabi's store is the most popular place. The protagonist sighs tiredly at the thought that she is now just an ordinary florist to everyone. The little girl repeats her request again. She really wants to make a present to her mom. After telling Shirabi a story about her mother, who is soon going to marry her father, the girl says that she wants to give her mother a nice wedding gift. An angel and a demon swirl around the protagonist's head, one saying it's a waste of time, and the other claiming she's just a child. Eventually, the angel wins, after which the gardener asks what kind of bouquet she wants to give. In response, the girl holds out a drawing to her, which leaves her even more perplexed. The gardener assumes it is a flower called a lily. Pierre, noticing that Shirabi is going to do the bouquet out of politeness, says the quote, trials are no hindrance to love. The girl with a drop of irritation on her face says she doesn't know what the man is talking about at all. She explains that the flower she wants only grows in hard-to-reach places, and only at high elevations. It blooms its buds in spite of mountain winds and storms. The gardener realizes that she can't tell exactly what kind of flower it is from the drawing, so she has to go to the cliff and check for herself. The protagonist agrees to the girl's order and gives her a sketch pad. However, she warns the customer that the price will be much higher than usual because the flowers she wants are not easy to find. The little girl asks to clarify with the saleswoman what the exact amount of the service will be. Factoring in the cost of travel and the difficulty of the task, Shirabi says it will work out to 20 gold at best, maybe more. In tears, the girl holds out to the gardener a single five gold coin that she had brought with her. But her mood improves in an instant, when, out of pity, the girl makes a discount for her. Shirabi tells her to come for the bouquet the day after tomorrow and not to forget about it. The child agrees and bows in gratitude. Afterward, they say a cheerful goodbye and the customer leaves the gardener's store. Time passes and evening comes. The gardener puts on comfortable shoes on her feet as if she were going somewhere. Pierre notices this and tries to stop her because his friend hasn't slept for 24 hours. However, Shirabi says she has to go flower shopping because she can't make a bouquet out of flowers she's never seen before. Guy asks her if she'll feel defeated when it's time to go to the Imperial Palace. So he asks the girl not to do that and asks if it would be easier for her to just modify the flowers growing there, to which she replies no. Leaving the store, the gardener explains that flowers are many times weaker than trees and tells her friend not to worry about her. Suddenly, Shirabi, walking along a path through the forest, is caught up by Pierre and asked to stop. The girl, on the other hand, pointing her finger in the distance, asks the guy if this place is suitable, but as she looked around, she wondered if it was the right road. Pierre suspects that she doesn't know where she is going, since this is the third time they have been down this road. Shirabi covered her ears at his indignation and asked him to let her think about it, after which they moved on. Twenty minutes later, as the sun was already setting, the couple came upon a tall, steep mountain. Seeing this, the girl was already starting to think that she had made a mistake and had been going the wrong way all this time. Sighing, Pierre asks his friend to finally admit that she too has her faults. The gardener is in no hurry to accept this, but admits that she has a couple of flaws, just like any other person. While her friend is looking up at the top of the mountain, the guy says he guessed why she decided to start the search in the afternoon. But suddenly, Shirabi starts calling for a certain Lafia, which makes Pierre a little wary. He wanted to inquire about what she was doing or who she was calling for, but through her screams, it was impossible to do so. Suddenly, very high up on the mountain, a beautiful flower bush responded and asked if his name was his. The gardener replies that she does and that she wants to take the flower for herself. When asked by the flower why she wanted it, Shirabi said that some girl really wanted to give it to her mother. After that, a beautiful girl, as beautiful as this flower, came down from the mountain, looking like a fairy. She interjects if she is really to be given a gift, whereupon the protagonist replies in the affirmative. The gardener wanted to explain to Lefilea that if she didn't want to do it, she wouldn't do it. But the fairy still stated that she agreed, even if it was a small child. Shirabi explains to the lady that this girl may be clumsy in her care, such as skipping watering time or, conversely, watering too often. But Lefilea asked the girl to shut up by placing her index finger on her lips, then reminding her that she was aware of all this. Flying back, the fairy says she'll sort it all out herself, but the protagonist will have to work hard to get her. Reincarnating back into her flower, Lafia asks Shirabi to do whatever it takes to get her. The girl immediately decides to act and pulls a long, thick rope out of the bucket. Pierre becomes worried and says that one rope is not enough for insurance and wants to offer his friend his help. However, the gardener, tying herself tighter around his waist, tells him not to worry and that she will climb in there alone and handle everything. The guy keeps saying that Shirabi might fall and break her neck, 
to which she wonders what makes him think she'll fall. Soon the girl was already climbing confidently up the rock, making her way closer and closer to the flower. She was supported by little fairies that flew around her and shouted comforting phrases. But Pierre, compared to them, was not so calm, and as if he had a premonition of trouble, he decided to fly closer to the girl and call out to her, but she paid no attention to him. Suddenly, what the boy had been so afraid of happened. Shirabi, tripping over a rock, began to tumble down the mountain. Before Pierre could understand anything, a tree that grew on a rock not far from them cried out to help the gardener. Pulling one of her branches toward the unfortunate, the girl deftly grasps it, thus saving her life. After calming down a bit, she fumbles with her foot for a ledge in the rock, which she leans on to keep from falling again. After a few minutes, after expending a decent amount of energy, Shirabi successfully crawls to his target. She digs up the flower, whereupon the fairies start circling around her again, congratulating her on her victory. Thanks to their own magic, the girl comes down to earth painlessly with the flower. After planting the loot in a bucket, she sat down tiredly on the ground and admitted that climbing the mountain had been hard. Shirabi notices her not-so-small wound on her knee, which is also very sore. Pierre grumbles that he has already warned her about such consequences. He says no matter how strong she is, the gardener could still be seriously injured or even die. The one who is sick of hearing her friend's grievances covers her ears with her hands. Suddenly, Pierre, deftly seizing the bucket with the flower, takes the girl in his arms, whose surprise is written on her face. Shirabi says she realizes that because of the wound on her leg, she won't be able to walk, but still doesn't understand why her friend is doing this. The ghost, after comparing the girl to a small child, says he will carry her home himself. After a short thought, the gardener happily agrees with him and lets him help her. And the guy, seeing her reaction, assumes that she likes to be carried in his arms. After a while, they end up at the store where Shirabi has transplanted Lephilea into a pot. The fairy of this flower did not take long to arrive either, and the protagonist decided to ask her about the best place to put it. Ta says that she just hates the heat and the scorching sun, and prefers more of a cool shade. Shirabi writes everything down in her notebook, but suddenly, Lefilea decides to ask her why she is so reverent about it. As she flies closer, the fairy wonders if the gardener is doing all this to get her to refuse to be a gift. The girl explains that if the tree only has roots left, it can still sprout again. With flowers, however, it is different. When transplanting, they often dry out quickly. Lephilia laughs and says it doesn't matter, and that she can still bring joy to people. The fairy shares the protagonist's worries that spirits must spend their entire lives in the same place as their plant and live in comfort. But at the same time, she believes that it's all meaningless, and she will be happy if she can make someone happier with her bright life. Touching the fingers of Shirabi, who is not thrilled to hear such words, Philia says that everyone has different desires, and one day she will understand hers too. In the meantime, she decides to give the gardener a blessing. She blesses her with good luck in her relationship. The girl is perplexed by her words. She feels like crying. After that, Lefia's spirit disappears. Noticing his friend's downcast mood, Pierre wanted to support her and ask her how she was feeling. In response, she sarcastically wonders what reason she has to be out of order. Shirabi can't believe this flower wanted to do this all along. She recognizes that being a gardener is not an easy job. Anxiously drinking a glass of water, the girl sits down in a chair, saddened by the fact that she has to listen to all of this. She is now relieved that she can finally get some rest, when suddenly there is a knock on the door. Fiery to the point of flaming from the mouth, the gardener opens the door to the visitor and yells about the sign showing, Closed! The man was taken aback by this greeting from the girl, while she continued to berate him for his late arrival time. But Shirabi stops screaming when he recognizes the stranger as one of the knights of the Imperial Palace. The man was pleased that the girl recognized him, after which he confirmed that he was just a knight. And he came for a reason. The guy gives the gardener back her tool that she left at the palace. But at this moment, his attention is drawn to the wound on the leg of the protagonist, from which blood is still not weakly dripping. Before Shirabi could realize anything, the imperial knight had carefully wrapped a handkerchief around her knee. Afterward, the knight says that she looks tired, so he will not keep her long. He hopes that the gardener will return to them tomorrow. The man leaves the store, leaving the girl, who couldn't get a word out, with a bunch of questions. Pierre noticed her puzzled expression and ironically asked if she regretted not being able to hit that guy. Shirabi gets angry again and says she didn't have to do that, and then asks her buddy who he thinks she is. The gardener leaves the room, leaving Pierre with his unfortunate joke alone. Still, the guy breathes a sigh of relief that his friend's deep wound is now rewound. Next, he squats down and tries to reach for a small first aid kit, 
but his hand passes through the object. The spirit of Le Filea, who has been watching him all this time, asks Pierre if he is used to living in his intangible body. He admits that, as a human being who should have a physical body, he is now acting unnaturally. The fairy says that it looks as if he is not telling the truth. The guy says that human relationships are saturated with lies, which is not the case with spirits, so there's no point in lying to him now. A day later, the young customer receives her order, from the beauty of which she cannot take her eyes off. Shirabi gives the child her coin and tells her not to come to her again because she doesn't plan to farm them anymore. The girl says that she understood everything and happily thanks the gardener for her services. Afterward, she runs home from the garden store, glowing with happiness. Remembering the fairy's words that she would be happy to be able to give someone a smile, Shirabi smiles herself as she looks after the girl. Meanwhile, a young client, who has already lost her former enthusiastic smile, walks down a dark alley with a flower. She enters a dark house where a certain girl was waiting for her. She asks if she has done as she was told. The girl replies that she has done so, and then hands the lady a pot with a plant. The lady is very happy about it. She takes it away and sets it on the table, marveling that she was able to get the real Le Filea. The girl recalls that it has been three years since the protagonist appeared in the capital and created a sea of problems for her. She grabs Shirabi's garden shop business card and mercilessly burns it in the fire. The girl promises herself that she will never allow her abuser to be put in charge of organizing a festival, celebrating the founding of the country. The flower it has can withstand high winds, storms, and produces beautiful buds. But like roses that have thorns, the fragile-looking Le Filea also has her own weapons. If you grind its petals into powder and put them in a drink, the drinker will die from the paralyzing poison. The girl says she'd love to see the flower that Shirabi has struggled so hard to find stab her in the back. The gardener is haggling with the man at the table. She is not satisfied with the price she has been offered in exchange for the goods. She tells her interlocutor that she is not the petty gardener he thinks she is. The man suggests that she set the price herself. The girl says she will take 75 silver and not a coin less for the trees. The man was not comforted by this price, to which Shirabi justifies that the trees are unusual and only sold in her store. The buyer becomes angry because he can't get the price down, even though he was counting on the gardener's youth and inexperience. The man summarizes that she will sell all the trees and growth gas petals in the box for 95 gold. But suddenly his eyes lit up with the hope of buying everything cheaper when the girl started saying she would give him a special bonus. But in reality, it turned out that Shirabi would simply make a one-coin discount for him. The man gave up hope that it would be a gold coin. But seeing the gardener's displeasure, he assumed it was silver. The saleswoman replied that it was a bronze coin and that nowhere was it seen that things were given away for nothing. The buyer was greatly disappointed, for the discount of one bronze coin would save almost no money from the amount. Having bought everything at the set price, the man left the store, flooded with tears, and the gardener waved him goodbye joyfully. Shirabi, over the moon with happiness, began counting her money, imagining how she would pay off a slightly larger portion of her debt. But Pierre asks her to stop counting coins, because they are not going anywhere, and better to think about the upcoming festival in honor of the founding of the country. The guy then wonders if her reluctance to do this festival is that great, to which the gardener suggests that he himself would not want to be involved in organizing it. Shirabi says that if she orders the imperial gardeners to do anything, all she will hear in response is their displeasure that she is bossing them around. The girl thinks that preparing for the festival will be a living hell, Pierre asks her what she is going to do. Chuckling, the girl says that maybe this is the night she'll get to escape to another country, much to her friend's displeasure. Suddenly, a man appears in the room whom Shirabi and Pierre did not expect to see. This unexpected guest turned out to be the crown prince. The girl, though in a state of shock, does not forget to say hello to him intelligently. She, remembering the bag of money she recently received, hides it, throwing it into the plant box. The gardener jokes that the gentleman has nothing to do. He, on the other hand, says that he has decided to come to see her in person. The prince asks if she really doesn't want to take part in a future festival. The girl does not answer his questions in any way, but only makes a disgruntled face. Next, the crown prince makes it clear that he knows about her debt, and a very large one at that. The gentleman says that if last time he could not persuade the girl with the help of stick in the form of threats, now he wants to do it with the help of carrot. This time, the prince offers Shirabi 1,000 gold pieces for her services and promises to give the whole amount at once. The protagonist was very surprised at first and then wondered about her creditor and how the imperial gardeners would treat her. 
Even so, she falls to her knees in front of the crown prince, excitedly declaring that she agrees. Pierre, watching his friend's latest race for money, catches shame for her again. As soon as the prince left, Shirabi immediately began racking her brain over what she should do with so many coins. The guy wonders if she wanted to pay off her debt, to which she says she has already collected the amount she has to pay next month. The gardener is immensely happy to realize that for the first time in her life, she has so much money that will stay in her hands. She is thinking about expanding the store a bit and giving it a facelift. Then she generally says that at this rate, she might buy the neighborhood daycare. She then suggests that Pierre get a pet, like a kitty or a dog. But the guy says he doesn't want any cats because he's allergic to them. Shirabi was about to laugh at the spirit with allergies when suddenly she heard a knock. The couple immediately turned their attention to him. Opening the visitor's door, the girl saw in front of her a gorgeous bouquet of red roses that was even bigger than herself. She nonchalantly tells the man with the bouquet that she is not a florist and that the flowers are still alive, but she doesn't know how to help him. But suddenly, a now former imperial knight peeks out from behind the bouquet and wonders if the gardener remembers him. Presenting the lady with flowers, the guy says he didn't bring them because he has some kind of request for her. Elegantly kissing Shirabi's hand, the knight says it's a gift for her. While the girl doesn't understand what's going on, the suitor is surprised that even though she has a flower shop, she said she doesn't sell flowers. Guy walks into the store, looking around and assuming that her store must be very pretty. He goes on to say that his name is Cayenne, and, as she already knows, he is a knight. Shirabi embarrassingly agrees to this. Suddenly, Cayenne, working up the courage to ask the protagonist if she will be free during the festival, honoring the founding of the country, Knight says he will be free all the time after the procession is over, so he would like to spend the festival with Shirabi. The girl wanted to answer something, but he beat her to it, saying that she could inform her decision directly on the day of the holiday. After recommending her to think hard, Kayan hurriedly left as he had to stand watch today. After apologizing if he distracted the gardener from her work, the knight says goodbye, wishing to see you soon. Shirabi remains standing like that, unable to utter a single word out of shock. But suddenly she is surprised that this knight has never been to a festival honoring the founding of the country, while Pierre says that's not the case at all. The protagonist doesn't see any romantic subterfuge in Cayenne's behavior, so she decides that he just doesn't have any friends and decided to call her out. The ghost sighs irritably and asks if she's really going to accept an invitation from him. The guy asks this for a reason, because as it turns out, he wanted to with Shirabi during the festival too. In response, the girl is upset that Pierre has no friends either, but she remembers that he can't have any, because only she can see him. Plucking a hair off his head, the gardener says she can tie it to him for good luck, and then offers to go to the festival with Cayenne to him instead. A saddened Pierre leaves the girl, regretting what he had said. Shirabi, on the other hand, could not understand what he wanted. A short period of time passes. Putting the roses in a vase, the girl remembers Lafiea's words that she wants to be a gift and please her recipient after which she smiles at the fact that she was able to understand her words to some extent. Pierre got so caught up in her smile that he spilled water past her for the tree. He thinks about the fact that his friend usually smiles only at the sight of money. Suddenly, he has a startling realization. She's smiling because she likes Cayenne. So a misunderstanding has taken root. After a while, being the imperial palace, Shirabi plants the last sapling in the ground and waters it with a growth gas petal. When she finishes her work, she admires the beautiful garden she herself has transformed. Pierre says the garden shines with a special brilliance today, while the girl reluctantly accepts his compliment. Suddenly, an elder appears nearby and declares that the gardener's power is slowly growing and she is having some effect on the plants nearby. Noticing that the spirit is talking about her power, the girl asks him to tell her more about it. However, her partner makes the argument herself that the plants were not particularly friendly before, but now they themselves are taking the initiative to help. Shirabi herself also notices that the spirit of the flower has become much more distinct than the little ones she has seen before. She then asks the old man if the fact that she is getting stronger is a good sign. The spirit, however, says that the process cannot be viewed from only one side, for every action has its counteraction. Even if someone wants to lead a peaceful life, there is a good chance that they will not succeed. The old man compliments that there are those everywhere who envy people born with such talent. The spirit warns Shirabi about the danger and that it is not good to make many enemies because three years ago, one unpleasant incident had already happened to the protagonist. Pierre inquires about the incident that happened three years ago, to which the girl, covered in sweat, says that it was only a small absurdity. Three years ago, 
all gardeners considered shirabi their number one enemy. Because of this, the girl often had to erase the nasty inscriptions against her. And one day at that time, two men told her that she was rumored to own the most lucrative shop in the capital. They also said that it is rumored that the main character has no moral principles at all, and she doesn't know what shame is at all. Another man confirms that the blue-eyed babe has no understanding of the matter and absolutely no respect for her older colleagues. His buddy agreed with him that what goes around comes around, comes around. In the end, the two cemented the belief that Shirabi would not last long in his job. But at this point, the girl did not tolerate their bullying and said that they had no right to harm someone else's store and allow themselves to threaten her. Men, on the other hand, say that everything they have is earned with blood and sweat, that they didn't threaten her, only gave her advice. After nailing the girl with a flick, they left, complaining that their mood had finally soured and they couldn't be in that place anymore. The angry Shirabi had nothing to do but stare at her abusers, and it wasn't that she had done anything wrong at the time. Time returns to the present, where a beautiful young lady admires her transformed garden. Her servant says that the new gardener, who is young but very talented, has done it all. In fact, three years ago, the main character was disliked because of the usual envy. In gardening, she was a head above the others. A flashback from the past pops up, as Shirabi sees a mountain of notes on her desk, after which she asks the butler what it all means. The butler, however, replies that these are requests sent by the duke's wife and her friends. And that means that every mansion in their capital city is offering the girl a job. This news surprised the gardener very much. Hearing this story, it was obvious to Pierre that this had definitely caused an explosion of discontent among the other gardeners. The guy even suggests that the gardeners of the capital may have lost their livelihood, which the girl also agrees with. Shirabi says she's pleased, of course, but the gardeners were losing their jobs because of her, so she understands exactly why those people hated her. Because of this, she had to change her business practices, which her partner had already noticed. One of those methods is that her store is now out of business three days a week. And on weekdays, it only accepts a strictly limited number of requests. Pierre praises his friend and expresses that she has made a good compromise. Shirabi supports his words and says that after the introduction of these measures, other gardeners left her alone, except for the imperial ones. The ghost was upset to hear this and wondered what the girl had displeased them so much. The protagonist replies that people with inferiority complexes don't need an excuse to start doing nasty things. From her memory comes the moment she wanted to open the doors for another customer, but instead got a rotten egg in her face. She wiped her eyes and looked at the floor, where sheets of various offensive language were scattered across the floor. Shirabi admits that the rotten eggs and hostile flyers were only blossoms until she saw more. Squeezing through the crowd that was viewing the gardener's mutilated property, the girl saw her sign, which had been smashed to pieces. She thinks that breaking the sign was rather childish, but what she saw afterward really struck her. The gardener notices her plants that were brutally killed by her haters. The spirits of the plants could not survive either. This made Shirabi the most frightened of all. There were signs of abuse to her plants everywhere, but that wasn't all. The gardener also notices a white powder that has been scattered on the ground. She guesses that it is herbicide, which makes her demonically angry. The girl was so angry that she ignored the entire crowd and ran to the store and closed herself in there. Shirabi has put a warning sign in front of the store, but she believes the bullying won't stop just because of the sign. Suddenly, the protagonist sadly says that she shouldn't have opened her store there. The past rampages of the Imperial Gardeners continued, which was the last straw for her, and in one devious way, she decided to avenge all her mangled trees. The girl breaks out of her memories and touches one tree in the Emperor's garden and says that this is her revenge. Pierre was surprised when he heard the name of the tree Six Day Mock, as he had never heard it before. Shirabi confirms that before she created it, it really didn't exist. Suddenly, the gardener says that the tree is poisonous, whereupon Pierre curses at her for touching it anyway. But the girl reassures him that nothing will happen from touching this tree, and trouble will start for anyone who seriously wants to harm a six-day-old moak. When damaged, the tree releases a liquid that immediately causes its offender to vomit violently. Also, Shirabi adds that after poisoning, the person will have a fever, so he will suffer for another six days. Thus, the protagonist paid for all the atrocities of the Imperial Gardeners. After hearing the effects of the poison poisoning, Pierre guesses the origin of the name Six Day Mock. The gardener says that even when an inspection from the Imperial Palace came to her, they couldn't accuse her of anything. And then Shirabi filed a complaint against the Imperial Gardeners for damages. She recalls that after the incident, they rested, 
but a strained relationship remained between them. The girl imagines the reaction of the gardeners when they found out she would be organizing the festival. But suddenly, the spirit spoke about being wary of more than just humans. The girl asks for a more detailed explanation. The elder is aware that the protagonist has been frequenting the imperial palace recently. Based on this, he says that what the girl was so afraid of happened to one tree in the palace garden. Shirabi wonders if the condition of the man-made tree has begun to deteriorate. She grabs the spirit by the shoulders and asks if the one who grew the tree knows. But the spirit only slightly depressedly bows its head and waves its head. The young lady asks if there is anyone among the imperial gardeners who could do such a thing. But at the same moment, a realization comes to her. The girl gives up and understands that even if there is, the spirit still won't tell her. The young lady bites her nail and realizes that she probably should have prepared purified water in advance. The spirit is just silent. And then he puts his hand on the main character's head and asks her to be careful because the young lady must take care of herself. After that, he leaves, leaving the young lady alone with her thoughts. The main character tells the spirit as he leaves that the reason he is telling her this now is because he doesn't have much time left. After Shirabi is alone, she touches a tree, which seems to feel all her pain. Tara approaches her from behind. He tries to calm and support the main character. In the evening, the young lady sits all teary and with wet hair. The guy combs her curls and asks him to listen, because the girl will have a headache later, so she should stop crying. But the main game just screams at me to shut up. But suddenly her gaze falls on the basket standing on the table behind them. The main character picks up a letter from it and asks where it comes from. The guy replies that it was lying under the door, and the young lady was unable to read anything, so he put it on the table. When Shirabi opens it, he sees words of gratitude and a drawing. The young man asks if this is a response letter from that little girl. The main character smiles and says that she thought the baby couldn't really read, but apparently she was mistaken. A young lady looks at a bottle with leaves and wonders if it is tea leaves. But suddenly she is terribly sleepy, so the girl decides that she will understand when she brews them. She leaves the tea leaves on the table and realizes that she is terribly tired today. Tara tells her to at least dry her hair, but he can see that the young lady is really tired. So the guy sighs and doesn't say anything else. A little time later, he enters the main character's room and covers her. The young lady opens her eyes and asks why he doesn't nag her. The guy with the purple hair says that some days you can do without it. Shirabi can't help but laugh at these words. The young man, realizing that she was laughing, blushed a little. He claims that anyway, the young lady doesn't have any work tomorrow so she can get a good night's sleep. He then turns to her and wishes her good night and sweet dreams. And a few hours later, the main character is already sitting in the emperor's garden near a mug of tea. Shirabi was summoned to the imperial palace, where she met with the crown prince. The young lady, all sleepy, asks why his highness called her. He casually says that he doesn't know, and then asks if he really needs a reason to call her to him. The main character says that she thinks a reason is needed. But then she realizes that she is a simple person, and the crown prince is sitting in front of her. So the lady with pink hair corrects herself and says that she meant that she wished there was a reason. The guy with ruby hair crosses his legs and says that the girl doesn't know how to hide her emotions, but it doesn't matter because he likes her privacy. The crown prince says that now that he has seen her withering gaze, he can say that he called her for two reasons. The first concerns the preparation of a festival in honor of the founding of the country, because the young lady needs to decide on the concept, and he is interested in how much the matter has progressed in recent days but the young lady seems to be hurt by these words. The prince continues and says that since he spent a significant amount of money on this, he has the right to receive a report on the work done. The main character says that it is, but dragging a person out of bed is a little too much. The young man with red hair says that he is a busy man, and the one who received the money must adapt to the schedule of his employer. The young lady understands that there is no arguing with this, so she turns to the servant and in a whisper asks Togo to get her out of there under the pretext of urgent work. Well, when the girl realizes that this won't work, she admits that she didn't even start doing anything, but be that as it may, in a week everything will definitely be ready, because the plants will be grown in an unusual way. The crown prince folds his hands and says that both are true, and Shirabi asks if she can now hear the second reason why he called her. The prince smiles and looks away. He claims that, as he said earlier, he is a busy man but he doesn't even have time to visit the hillside mansion that the girl brought to life. So he tried to console his heart by looking at Shirabi instead. After all, she is so similar to those pink trees. The guy folds his hands and says that after they started talking, they were preparing for a festival in honor of the founding of the country. 
Then he became interested in something else, after which the guy asks what the limit of her abilities is. The young lady looks at him and thinks that she has never given other people clear explanations about her abilities. Whether it was the power of the earth or the water, people who made deals with it could only speculate, but no one knew the exact answer to this question. But this man is convinced that she grows plants using her abilities. Therefore, the main character only asks if he orders him to tell about his skills. The guy knocks on the table and claims that everything is not like that, and he just asked. Then the main character says that in this case she won't say anything, because who would simply share such information so easily? She looks at him with some contempt and claims that it is not fair if they do not trust each other 100%. Everyone in this world is born with different powers, but it is difficult to determine exactly what powers a particular person has. This is because all people with abilities are slow to reveal their skills and limits. There are many reasons to keep them secret, and of course the most important of them is your own safety. All skills have their weak points, and revealing your abilities is the same as revealing your vulnerabilities. Therefore, in this world, there are unspoken rules not to delve too deeply into the abilities of others. When people tell someone about their abilities, it means that they completely trust this person. Then the legacy prince simply says the word eyes, but the main character does not understand what he is asking about. But the guy only adds that this is his ability. If he wants, he can see the entire capital from there to its very outskirts. The main character is a little shocked by this, because can a person who is the crown prince reveal his abilities so easily? In addition, the imperial palace itself is terribly huge, but how capable do you need to be to see the entire capital from there? The main character thinks a little about all this, and then she turns to the crown prince and claims that her ability is that she can talk to plants. The girl constantly developed it, so the range of possibilities in various nuances expanded significantly. A young man with ruby hair asks what these nuances are and asks for an example, but at the same moment, a maid bursts into the garden. She's out of breath and apologizes for interrupting the conversation, but an emergency has arisen. The main character turns around and asks what happened. The maid whispers about all this to the servant. Then he comes to the table and asks Shirabi to listen calmly, after all, in her shop. At this time, the crown prince uses his ability and sees that the entire shop is on fire. Therefore, before the servant has time to finish, he says that there was a fire there. The main character at this moment feels empty inside. Her legs seem weak, so the girl falls to the floor. The crown prince runs up to her. He asks Shirabi to calm down and come to her senses. After this, the young man with ruby hair claims that he will immediately send knights there. But at this time, Tara appears in the air. He takes the main character in his arms and disappears with her. The crown prince realizes that it was definitely Tara just now. The guy is trying with all his might to get to the shop as quickly as possible. The young man with ruby hair thinks a little at this time. He understands that that guy was next to this child. At this time, the main character and Tara are trying to get through the crowd. When they finally approach the burning building, the young lady looks at him in horror. People are trying to put out the fire with water. Some of them are shouting for more water to be poured. The young lady hears the cries of all the spirits. They desperately ask Shirabi for salvation. The main character at the same moment pushes Tara away. The young man asks him to wait stupidly, but Shirabi is already running as fast as he can. In her thoughts, she asks the distraction to hold out a little longer because she is already on her way. But suddenly, someone grabs the young lady's hand. The main character screams to be let go. This guy turns out to be the same knight. He says that he can't because it's just hot inside now. He claims that he cannot allow the young lady to fall into eternal sleep. The main character remembers how she died in a past life, and when she woke up, she found herself in this world. She screams that even if a person dies, he can be reborn. The guy with purple hair doesn't understand what she's talking about. Shirabi, with tears in his eyes, says that spirits only have one life. Then the guy can hear the screams of the spirits and asks if there are people left inside. The main character claims that even if, even after hearing the voices of the spirits, the knight tries to stop her, then he cannot be considered a human. After that, she runs straight into the flames. Tara sees this and heads after her, the knight biting her lip. But he decides not to remain idle, so he screams out with a request to listen to him, and then asks if there are people there who have the power of water. After all, this is a complicated fire, and the shop was set on fire by the power of fire. When the main character goes inside the building, she sees a spirit there. She is horrified and asks Togo to wait, and promises that she will stop the fire no matter what. But the spirit claims that this is not why he came there. He apologizes to Shirabi and says that he is sorry that he did not give her time to prepare, 
but he asks her to take care of others. The spirit places his hand on Shirabi's head and smiles sincerely. He says that if a miracle ever happens, they will do it again. But he doesn't have time to finish this phrase as the fire burns his soul to the end. The main character is in despair. She screams that this is not it. After this, he collapses to the ground trying to collect the remaining particles of the spirit. But the spirit of the old tree immediately released all its remaining strength. The flame was extinguished by the rays of light that soared upward. The stop of color was so huge that the entire capital saw it. The spirit of the old tree eventually died out, and although the shop was not damaged at all, the garden burned to the ground. The main character cannot hold back her tears because of this. Tara, seeing this, feels all this pain. He approaches Shirabi and hugs her. But suddenly, a drop with magical power falls on the floor. This power spreads throughout the garden, revitalizing all plants. Then the knights come running into the garden and ask where Shirabi is, and when the purple-haired knight sees her, he asks if she is okay. But in front of them, they see a beautiful picture of Tara and Shirabi hugging and a green garden around them. One of the people claims that he used to think that the gardener girl was an ordinary child who was characterized by impatience. But now that he has seen such and such, he wonders if she is the goddess of the forest herself. A few days later, a guy with purple hair claims that the target of the one who started the arson was Shirabi. The young lady says that it looks like it, and she even knows who could have done this, although these are just assumptions. The main character looks at the bottle of tea and asks what is wrong with these tea leaves. The guy claims that after reviving the garden, the girl slept for four whole days. During this time, he conducted an investigation, during which he also checked this gift, and it seemed that the tea leaves contained poison. If the girl had drunk tea that day, she would not have been able to escape and would have suffocated in the smoke. After these words, the young lady comes to a realization. She grabs the bottle from the guy's hands. But when she opens it and smells it, she realizes that it is La Philea. The young man does not understand what she is talking about and asks about it. But the main character says that these tea leaves exude the smell of La Philea. Shirabi immediately jumps up from the table and claims that he is going to the Imperial Palace because the criminal is there. The guy asks why she decided to go there so suddenly. But the young lady argues that they must put an end to this as soon as possible, and she certainly won't go alone. Tara says that this is natural because he is her companion, but when he turns around, he sees many plant spirits. The young man is a little surprised, and the main character says that someone dared to touch her in the garden, and the attacker must pay for it. Some time later, at the Imperial Palace, Shirabi says that she has already received permission from His Highness, the Crown Prince, and he asked for unnecessary hands off. The girl remembers the servants and asks if they are all under her control until the end of the festival in honor of the founding of the country. The servant only whispers to the main character whether the prince gave her permission and just left, and she replies that she thinks he is hiding somewhere nearby, and if he meets him, then let him lead him there, after which the main character enters the room with the gardeners. She walks past, examining each of them, but when she approaches the last one, she realizes that someone did not show up. She looks at the servants and asks, didn't she say that everyone should come? One of them thinks that this petty idiot managed to enlist the support of the crown prince, but this does not mean that she has become superior to them. Therefore, the guy claims that they themselves can transfer everything to those who are absent. And if a girl has something to tell them, wouldn't it be better to get to the point quickly? Shirabi shocked by such impudence. She approaches the guy and asks if he tells him that this is the crown prince. Will he also answer in a similar way? The young lady glares at him. Initially, Shirabi was an ordinary owner of a garden shop, so she was as close to the moon as the imperial gardeners. However, as long as she carries out her duties under the orders of the crown prince, then the young lady's words carry the same weight as his highness's. She pokes at one of the gardeners, who asks what she wants, but immediately corrects himself. The main character orders him to immediately bring the missing person. After a couple of seconds, the fairies inform the young lady that they are coming, and the same man comes in, and yet his smell still hasn't disappeared. This smell is a burning smell. At this moment, a lady with burgundy hair enters the room. As Shirabi suspected, the missing person is a criminal. The main character says that she didn't even think that she could be caught, but her interlocutor pretends that she doesn't understand anything. Then the main character grabs her by the collar and asks if the girl really thinks she's such a pump. She also asks what you were thinking when you looked at the garden on fire. The red-haired lady's eyes narrow a little at such accusations, but she immediately plays the fool and claims that she doesn't understand what Shirabi is talking about. The main character asks if she understands. She lets the villain go and says that in this case, she will explain everything to her.
The girl uses her power and plant spirits immediately appear in the air. The other gardeners are shocked by this because those spirits appeared out of nowhere. The main character says that the girl with red hair gave the order to the little girl and got Lephalea, and then sent tea containing her paralytic poison to her home and set the garden on fire. Shirabi asks if she was pleased to see these children suffer and scream in pain. The lady with red hair asks what she is talking about. Doubts begin to creep into the thoughts of the other gardeners. One of them asks if Susan really did this. But the girl says that this is not so and she would never do that. But the fairy with green hair says that she saw her face that day. She woke up calmly in the morning, but the first thing she saw surprised her. After all, it was the same woman, and flames were coming from her hands. The fairy claims that such lies will not work with her. The lady with red hair is shocked. She doesn't know how to respond to this. The main character only comes close to her and claims that this is a decision that was made by all the plants in the capital, and not just her alone. From now on, no plant that Susan tries to grow will follow her plans. Every plant, whenever it takes root, will be set against it. And even medicinal herbs will turn into poison if she decides to use them. After all, this is the verdict of the spirits. The red-haired lady is terrified and falls to the ground holding her head. The main character looks at her like a non-entity and then turns to the rest of the gardeners. She says that if anyone else is unhappy with her work, that she wants them to come forward and openly express everything to her face but no one is going to do this. Then the young lady smiles and says that if there are none, then they can now begin to discuss the festival in honor of the founding of the capital. After all this, the main character feels very tired, so she lies down on the bed. The girl thinks that even though the bed is soft, it seems as if all this is not hers. Several days have already passed since that incident, and the imperial gardener, recognized as a criminal to the end, denied his involvement in the fire. But a little time later, when she was eating salad, she suddenly felt very ill. Therefore, the girl immediately rushed to the bushes nearby. She was horrified by the realization that Shirabi's words could be true. But when she looked at her hand, she saw that the plants under it had turned black. The girl immediately jumped back in horror. Then she became convinced of the curse of the spirits. Susan immediately approached Shirabi with significant monetary compensation. The lady with pink hair understands that she accepted this money. But even if she begs her on her knees, the decision is still made by the perfume. In addition, the villainess took the life of the spirit of the old tree and Le Filet. So the young lady just turns around and wonders if this is her concern. But either way, it will be a great experience. The young lady tosses and turns on her bed and thinks that this situation may have arisen because of the renovation of her shop. But in the end, she got the chance to stay for a while in the imperial palace. But then something else catches Shirabi's eye. The girl immediately gets out of bed and heads to the window. After that, she rubs her eyes and looks at the garden. The girl then descends into it. She thinks she definitely felt a strange energy there, so the young lady wonders if it was a spirit. At this time, several spirits fly up to the main character and ask if the girl has come to take care of them. But Shirabi says that she, too, does not live by work alone. Then the young lady turns around and continues her search. One of the trees asks if she is looking for something, and then asks if she wants to climb on it and look around from above. The main character understands that maybe she should do this, after which she climbs that tree. But when the young lady gets to the top, her dress gets caught on a branch. This causes the young lady to lose her balance and fall backwards. She is scared that she will fall, so she closes her eyes. But when he opens them, he sees that he is in the hands of a knight. The guy asks if she is okay. Oh, the main character looks at him, not understanding what is happening. But then he realizes that it will open and claims that he is completely fine. She jumps off his arms and brushes the dust off her dress. The young man with purple hair looks at her and remembers all the events that happened in the garden. He asks if Shirabi is better, and the main character asks what he's talking about. The same one replies that he is talking about the incident with the garden, and her shop was also badly damaged due to the fire. The main character says that, fortunately, the fire did not penetrate the interior of the store, and she has already begun repairs using the compensation received. But then she frowns a little and says that thanks to the generosity of his highness, she was able to stay for a while at the imperial palace. She remembers how the guy with ruby hair said that until the store is renovated, Shirabi doesn't know where to stay. He turned to Glem and told him to order everything to be prepared, but the servant obeyed his master. The young lady asked what he was talking about and whether he wanted to hear her opinion on this matter, but his highness only asked if it should bother him. The lady with pink hair was shocked by these words. They even brought her into a stupor, but then the main character becomes furious. She screams that even if the imperial family lives happily ever after, 
to some extent not listening to anyone's opinion, you can't be so deaf. The main character is almost seething with anger remembering these events, but she sighs and tells the knight that everything is fine now anyway. She claims that the birth and disappearance of spirits is a kind of providence of nature. The knight asks if she means that when a tree dies, it is like the death of a person. The young lady sees the fairy on his shoulders and says that she thinks everything is exactly like that, but maybe such an incident is even much more serious than the passing of people from life. The guy kneels down and takes the main character's hand in his. He tells Shirabi with a smile on his face that he is still waiting. He claims that he is talking about the answer regarding the festival, but a moment later he gets up and says he's glad to see the young lady is okay, then bids her farewell and leaves. Fairies surround the main character. They ask if this is the person who likes Shirabi, and also if he is her lover. The young lady screams that everything is wrong, and then she turns around and says that she should find what she was looking for. One of the fairies asks what the girl is looking for, and the main character replies that she felt a strange energy, and it seems that it belongs to the spirit. But for some reason, the aura is somehow dark and unnatural. A couple of fairies look at each other. They then turn to Shirabi and say that it could be a spirit that devours people's souls. The fairy claims that once a high-ranking person living there touched that tree and has been unconscious ever since. And the fairy also heard that the crown prince, who was very kind to the lady right away with his hair, comes every day to look at the face of his younger brother. The main character says that it turns out that the prince was the victim and asks when this happened. One of the fairies claims that it was about a month ago and he should have died in the West. But apparently, thanks to the fact that he used his ability, he managed to survive. He separated his soul from his body and ran away so as not to be caught and eaten. The main character is shocked by these words. Now she understands that the spirit of the old tree gave her advice specifically about this story. The young lady does not understand what to do and where to find that tree. She continues on her way and thinks about what she should do. But suddenly she crashes her head into someone and then falls to the ground. When she looks up, she sees the crown prince. The guy with ruby hair asks what she's doing alone in a place like this. Shirabi greets his highness, who says that it seems the girl was looking for something. The young lady immediately jumps up and asks what he's talking about, but then says that she was trying to find inspiration for the founding festival of the country because they needed unusual ideas for decorations. The prince just laughs. He says that he did not know that the young lady had enough motivation to volunteer to work overtime and without additional pay. The young lady realizes that she has been tricked into this and decides to tell the truth. She says that she feels some strange energy nearby. His Highness approaches her and asks what this strange energy is. He grabs the main character's hand and asks if she discovered something or if it's just her intuition. But suddenly, the guy's gaze falls on something else. The crown prince is surprised because now he can see fairies. One of them flies up to him and claims that it looks like this man is seeing them now. The main character says that the spirits of the surrounding vegetation are now in front of his highness. The guy with ruby hair remembers how the main character talked about her ability. He lets go of her hand. And then she says that she said earlier that she could hear the voices of plants. But now the ability has strengthened, and she has become able to do even such things. He says that the girl's ability is closer to shamanism than to the field of gardening. A shaman is a person who knows how to communicate with spirits. The crown prince thinks about something and then turns to Shirabi. He tells her to follow him, because they need to go somewhere. As they walk deeper into the forest, the lady with pink hair asks where they are going, and His Highness states that they are heading to the garden. The main character is confused. She does not understand why she feels something more than just the energy of other spirits. She looks at His Highness and remembers the dark energy. So the girl grabs the crown prince's hand and tells him to wait. When the guy turns around, the young lady asks if it is in front, and if so, she will go on alone. The guy with ruby hair asks why, and the young lady notes that if he goes to take it off, his body will be in danger. She says that she feels the presence of something dark and sinisterly distorted ahead. But if it is a spirit, then she will be able to study its state. His Highness stops. He thinks whether he should do this. The ruby-haired guy ruffles his hair a little, and then deciding to say that he would look after her from there. When the main character enters the territory of that garden, she realizes that it is very quiet there, and it seems strange to her, because she almost does not hear the voices of other spirits. The young lady feels uneasy about this. She turns around, but suddenly hears someone's voice. It turns out to be Tara, he tells the young lady not to go any further. The main character asks why he is there and hasn't he read the book. But the guy just comes up to Shirabi and says that he should ask her what she forgot there, 
My girlfriend didn't return for a long time, and he went to look for her because he thought she was lost. The main character says that she is not lost at all, and in any case, he should also stay away from that place. After all, the tree that is in front exudes quite a strong resentment, so she gathers. But the main character doesn't have time to finish when the guy immediately stands in front of her. He tells the girl not to go there because it is dangerous. But the lady with pink hair only asks how he knew there was danger there. After this, the young man only brings her to the palace. The main character turns around and realizes that there is not a soul there. Afterwards, they approach the doors and Tara opens them. The main character feels an eerie energy emanating from that room. And in the middle of the room lies a man with a blackened hand. Tara only says that if she comes closer to that tree, it will be bad. The main character approaches that bed and sees a guy similar to Tara. She is shocked by this, and the young man claims that, being next to the tree, Shirabi can become like this, so he asks now that she has seen this whether she is still going to go. He claims that although the girl is a talented gardener, it is unlikely that anything can be done about this problem. After this, silence hangs between them. The young man looks at Shirabi. He puts his hand on his forehead and says that one day he was going to tell her everything, but the main character only claims that it was him. She says he was that ignorant prince. The main character says that she didn't see the tree, but even from a distance she felt someone's presence, and the guy managed to touch him. The young man asks if she is surprised, but Shirabi asks what he is talking about. Then the guy asks if she feels deceived, because the fact that he is a prince, the main character does not let us finish, and asks if he is talking about what he hid it's from her. The guy looks away. The main character says that she does not like to complicate her life. She asks if the guy has ever tried to hurt her, because she doesn't remember anything like that. Then she asks what problems there could be. The girl says that it is a little different from other perfumes, but she just thought that there must be some reason for that. The guy says that it works out, even after knowing everything, but Shirabi interrupts him and says that now that she knows this, she finds the situation a little strange. After all, even if someone is cursed by a tree for some reason, this person usually turns to a healer and not to a gardener. The guy just lowers his head. The main character turns to him and smiles, and then asks where this tree is. The guy goes to the window and opens the curtains. Then the main character can see that dark energy. When the girl looks closely, she sees a spirit there emitting dark energy. The main character is shocked by what she sees. The spirit woman flies closer to her. She says someone has come again. And then she asks if this is another stupid owner of the ability. The main character looks at her and claims that the girl is not a spirit. The woman approaches her and asks if she can see it, but says something. Whether she is a spirit or a demon, the young lady should not care at all, because the girl will die soon anyway. The woman claims that today she came out to greet the guest, and as soon as she finishes everything with the prince, she will do the same with her. The main character clenches her teeth, and then he turns to Tara and says that he needs to warn everyone about the danger, because this demoness is apparently determined to lure more people and steal their souls. Then the two of them leave the building, and the main character sighs. But when she raises her head, she sees the crown prince. The girl understands that, if you think about it, since Tara is a prince. It turns out they are siblings, and now she understands why they seemed so similar. The main character tells his highness the crown prince that she is inside. But he doesn't let her finish, and asks if she saw Tara there. The young man is shocked by this. He touches the main character and approaches his brother, and then asks how he knew. The crown prince claims he found out about his charade when there was a fire at her gardening shop, and perhaps Tara's meeting with her was inevitable. The guy with red hair is a little silent, and then he turns to Shirabi. When the main character comes unstuck, the prince asks if she can deal with this problem. The young lady remembers Tara lying on the bed and says that there is a chance. Then the crown prince sighs and tells her to name her price. He claims that he will pay whatever she says, but the main character says that she will not take the money. The young man with purple hair is shocked, and the main character says that she simply cannot allow her friend to die, and even if his highness ordered her to take on this matter, she would still do it. The lady with pink hair says with a smile on her face that she doesn't need anything. Well, then she realizes something and says that she cannot solve this problem right now, and it will take some time, so his highness must wait until after the founding festival, and the young lady asks if she can use the library of the imperial palace. A short time later, Shirabi sits with a book, her head feels like it's about to split in two, after which the girl lies down on the table and says that it's like she's taking a math exam again. Tara puts down her mug of tea and says she should get some rest, 
But the young lady just jumps up and asks who she is trying so hard for, and then asks if he forgot. But then the girl remembers that he is a prince and addresses him as you. The guy just smiles and tells her to just talk to him as before, because she even communicates with his brother quite freely. The main character remembers how she said that if she thinks about it, how can she now address him so disrespectfully? Well, the guy replied that if this was an unimportant official meeting, then he didn't care at all. Afterwards, the two of them look at the crown prince. He asks why they were staring at him and whether he is their main villain. And after that, he says that the young man can do as he pleases and asks if the guy is not her best friend. Now the young man says that his brother said so. And then he turns to the main character and asks if she dug up anything. But the young lady replies that she didn't. She claims that the matter cannot be done without shamanism. She is going to ask the shaman about this. The young man asks if she is going to do this. And the main character answers that. Shirabi says that among her friends, there is a shaman who has entered into a contract with the spirit of water. Abilities like hers are rare, and perhaps the guy even heard her name because she is from the Zelban Empire. Tara approaches the young lady and asks if she is talking about Yuvlin. The main character says that then the guy really knows her, and he replies that shamanism is an extremely rare ability, and besides, as far as he knows, there is only one shaman in the Zelban Empire. Shirabi says that the guy must have studied hard if he is so knowledgeable even about a foreign country. But Yuvlin is a well-known figure in the empire who has renounced his title and is working in a mercenary unit. Most likely, she is very busy, so it is not a fact that she will go to such a distant place in response to Shirabi's call. The main character bows her head and says that for her she is only a stalker, but the girl remembers how Yuvlin trailed behind her. The main character claims that if she says that she is busy and cannot come, then she will simply catch her and bring her there. The girl picks up the paper and doesn't understand how to write it. Tara smiles and looks at what the lady with pink hair is writing. But when he reads what was written, he is shocked. The guy reads that she wrote hello and that she has business with Zelbin and then wrote that if she says that she is busy, she will no longer be alive. After writing the sheet, Shirabi gets up and thinks about preparing purified water for her while Yurban arrives, and the young man is still looking in shock at the ink-stained sheet. But the main character comes up behind him and taps him on the back and then leaves. When she leaves the room, the young man sighs and puts his hand on his back. And then he blushes because Shirabi's hand was there a little while ago. A few days later, the main character is already heading somewhere with a full basket of jars. But someone comes up to her and takes it off her hands. It turns out to be the same night with purple hair. He asks what all this is and where the young lady is going with it. After this, as they walk along the road, the main character replies that this is purified water and she is going to take it to the imperial palace. The knight asks what purified water is, and the main character replies that he can think of it as a supplement that one particular tree needs. The guy says that the girl must have received some order from his highness. And then he asks if preparations for the festival in honor of the founding of the country are going well. The main character remembers that festival, and then the memory of the knight asking her to come with him creeps into her mind. The lady with pink hair says that in general, but the guy interrupts her and says that he is not going to rush the young lady with an answer so she can calmly make any decision. And when the young man raises his head and sees that they have arrived, he puts the basket with jars on the floor, and he tells the main character that he will go and then wishes her a good day. Tara watches the guy leave. He narrows his eyes a little while looking at him. The main character thinks, she says that it's still a little strange, because that person is Keel. Tara asks what's wrong with him. And the main character replies that obviously he is a person, although she suddenly felt some very familiar energy. The guy asks if this is familiar energy, and the young lady says yes. She met him only recently, but for some reason it seems to her that she has already encountered similar energy before. The young man senses the dark energy and suddenly realizes it. So the guy says that what is more important now is that the place she is going to is this. The main character compliments his speech and says that everything is true, and this is his palace. When the main character enters this territory, she opens a bottle of purified water, and this allows you to trap dark energy in a jar. Tara is shocked by this. He says that these bottles contain purified water. The main character opens another one and says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. She places these jars everywhere to cleanse the area of poison, and this energy surrounds even the dark tree. The main character looks at what is happening there, and the woman made of wood apparently cannot get beyond that energy. The main character says that although the problem will not be solved completely, this will allow them to gain some time. And the catch is that they are now in the Imperial Palace. The young man asks what is wrong with the Imperial Palace. 
and the main character replies that the spirit of that rotten tree is quite strong, and perhaps he will be able to attack them in other ways. After all, there are many opportunities for this. The guy asks what other methods are and asks her to give an example, but the young lady puts her finger to her mouth and invites the guy to quickly come back, because for some time this purified water will act as a barrier. And during this time, the young lady would like people not to come near this place. She leaves and hopes that she can prevent any unnecessary commotion from occurring. The spirit from the rotten tree is trying to get out of the barrier at this time. But when she touches him, her fingers immediately turn black. The spirit of this rotten tree curses the main character and says that she is a damn gardener. The woman asks if she thinks that her cute tricks will affect anything, because the woman has a lot more trump cards up her sleeve than she thinks. At this time, a small white mouse runs past. The brunette sees this and sends dark energy to the animal. When the mouse smells it, its eyes turn red. The animal sniffs out something and then runs away, apparently with the woman already in control. At this time, the maid is calmly walking with a basket of things. She does not even suspect that the same mouse is standing behind the doors. The young lady continues on her way, and the rodent jumps out at her from behind. Hearing some sounds, the maid turns around. When she looks at them, she sees a rat. She throws the basket of things and screams, but then the door opens behind her, and the white shirt flies away. The maid looks at it in shock, and then she tries to get it, but no matter how hard she stretches, she can't. Therefore, a little later, she comes out with a lamp. A girl wanders around the garden, and you think what the hell this is all about. The young lady thinks how unlucky she is, but then they see a shirt lying in the grass. But when he tries to pick it up, who sees a bottle of dark energy? The girl picks it up and thinks what it is, and also where that bottle could have come from. At this time, the same rat is watching her, and a moment later she is already jumping on the girl. The maid is very afraid of the rodent, so she straightens the eggplant from her hands, and it breaks into pieces. The rat runs away, and the maid's dress turns out to be all stained with dark energy. After that, the same woman from the rotten tree comes out to her. The maid is very frightened by this and screams. Already in the morning, while the main character is sleeping peacefully, one of the knights knocks on her door. He shouts for Shirabi to open the door. The main character is already going down the stairs and asks what time it is, and who the hell could be busting like that early in the morning. After all this time, she finally returned home and is going to get a good night's sleep. The girl comes to the door and says that she is busy preparing for the festival in honor of the founding of the country. She opens the door and says she won't be taking regular orders for a while, but a spear is immediately pointed at her throat. The main character looks up and sees that these are imperial knights. Among them all is the same knight with purple hair. The girl asks why they are doing this, but they only say that this is to be expected from a shameless villain who ruined someone's life. He orders the other knights to arrest the criminal. The main character asks what this means because she did not plunge anyone into eternal sleep. The girl turns around and asks what they mean, but she never gets her answer, and the knights just drag her into a cage-like cart. The young lady tells them to call his highness the crown prince, and he will prove her innocence. But one of the guards asks how any commoner dares to demand that a royal person be called to her. He claims that His Highness the Crown Prince is not in the capital at the moment, and he was forced to leave for state affairs. Then the lady with pink hair says that they need to explain to her what is happening, because she doesn't even know why she was arrested. Then the guy gets up from his seat and approaches the main character. And then he leans over to her and says that he doesn't think the girl really knows anything. He pokes her on the forehead and says that yesterday, when she came to the Imperial Palace, many saw that she was carrying some bottles with unknown contents in a basket. The young lady asks what's wrong with the bottle's theme, but the guy claims that a man died in the garden. The maid was found already lifeless next to the same broken bottle. Her whole body turned black. The main character, hearing this, is shocked and once again asks if someone died. But the guy claims that he hasn't finished yet and says something about how her body has turned black, reminiscent of a black spot on the prince's hand which lies in his chambers. Therefore, the crime the young lady is accused of. The main character doesn't let him. Finish and says that this is an attempt on the life of a member of the imperial family. The guard asks if she now understands what position she is in. He claims that this is not just plunging into eternal sleep, and probably the matter will even reach the ears of his imperial majesty. The main character curses that rotten tree, but then she sighs and tries to calm down. The young lady understands that with such accusations, she will definitely face execution. No one knows about the conversation that took place that day between the crown prince, Tara, and Shirabi except themselves. If His Highness the Crown Prince left the capital on state affairs, there's only one person left who can prove her innocence. In his case, 
The poison was able to absorb an entire hand with just one touch, and now a woman made of rotten wood finished off a man with ease. The young lady asks Tara not to do something stupid out of passion. At this time, the young man's hand twitches. Then the maid enters the room with flowers. She looks at old wilted flowers and changes them. The girl realizes that everything has dried up again. She says what a poor prince he is and asks what kind of illness he has. But when she turns around, she sees that the prince is sitting. The girl screams and turns to his highness, and the guy only asks if his imperial majesty is now in the main palace. After which he asks to be told that the second prince requests an audience. The maid is shocked and asks what he is talking about. And then he understands and immediately runs out of the room, obeying his master. The guy understands that the fact is that he can appear to others if he is in contact with Shirabi. He spent the morning rummaging through the trash. He had never been so lucky as today. Although the guy had to rummage through the trash to get her hair, but then he hears screams outside the door. One of the servants asks his highness what business he came there for, but the man just burst into the room and screams the name of his son. He says that he was informed that Tara had come to his senses, but what does all this mean? After all, his highness sees two people in front of him. The guy just kneels down and asks his father to order everyone out, because he needs to say something, and the conversation will concern a girl who was unjustly locked in prison. The emperor sits down on a chair and says that, in general, to summarize what his son just said. That girl named Shirabi came to the imperial palace solely to help him, and she was absolutely not to blame. Tara says that's exactly how it is. Well, his highness says that he still has many questions, because his son lost consciousness and cannot come to his senses. Therefore, he asks who would even believe the testimony that the guy gave in such a state. Tara tries to say something. But His Highness the Emperor says that's enough. He claims that he doesn't think his son lied, and he's not going to be happy about the guy standing in front of him like that. Perhaps this is the result of the revelation of the abilities that the boy originally had. His Highness says that he understands what he wants from him, and claims that he will order the release of that child, Shirabi. Nevertheless, it will take at least two or three days to find at least some excuse for such a decision. His Highness says he will go for it, but Tara must keep them in mind when it's all over. Then he will have to give explanations that will convince everyone. The emperor asks if he understood him. The prince bows and says that yes, he will definitely do so. Two days later, many scientists had already gathered at the crime scene. The knights told their colleague that the investigation of the crime scene had been completed and he could entrust the remaining work to them. And the guy replied that then he would go to the suspect. When he opened the doors to the dark basement, he began to walk up the stairs. But the young man with blue hair curses that place because every time he goes down there it chills him to the bone. When the guy approaches the cage with the main character, he takes out the keys. The young lady looks at him and wonders what awaits her. The knight tells her to go out because this is an order from his majesty. After a little time, the main character is already free. She is breathing a little heavily. Tara approaches the girl and asks what about relaxing first and then starting to work. But the young lady only asks if she has time for this now. She says she was jailed for two days so she lost all her time allotted for preparing for the festival. But for this work, she was paid a thousand gold coins. And His Highness the Crown Prince will also be back soon, so the young lady continues her work. The guy wants to object to something. However, the main character says that she doesn't want to hear any buts, and besides. The girl turns around and points to the other gardeners. She claims that that company is boring into her with their evil glances. One of the girls approaches her and asks if Miss Shirabi is really sane. The main character turns around and says exactly. Then the girl points to the empty pots and asks what they are and whether the young lady wants them all fired. A couple of people pass near those pots. One of them asks if it wasn't said that there will be a parade there. The authors say that it looks like the current festival in honor of the founding of the country will be simple. The main character sighs and asks how the sparrow can understand the great plan of the heron. She waves her hand and says that she shouldn't waste her energy talking now so she asks the gardeners not to start unnecessary quarrels. The girl screams what she said. She grits her teeth and says that the young lady has taken on the most important task. So how can she behave like this? This is already infuriating the main character, so she turns to the gardener and folds her arms over her chest. The girl gets a little scared by this and asks what the lady with pink hair is going to do. She wonders if Shirabi has gathered her wonderful powers to deprive her of the opportunity to eat foods of plant origin and whether she is thinking of expelling her from the imperial palace. Shirabi just comes closer to her and tells her to listen carefully. She claims that the fact that Susan, or whatever her name is, can no longer eat plants and their fruits was the decision of the spirits. As for the other thing, 
the gardeners will soon see with their own eyes whether she ruined the parade or not, and maybe it will surprise them. But she does her job properly, so the girl shouldn't mind her own business and do what she's been assigned to do properly. Suddenly someone cries out asking for forgiveness, but claims that he is in a hurry. The guy, all smelly, asks if there are ten white oak seedlings there. The main character says that as you should know, now this is an expensive pleasure, but he only asks how much the purchase will cost. Shirabi replies that one seedling will cost a gold coin, after which they make a deal. The main character is counting the coins, and Tara says that the girl is really very busy and asks what the buyer is for today. The young lady thinks that the news of how she used her powers in the earlier fire incident has been widely publicized. And on the eve of the festival, even despite the fact that she named a high price, more than 20 orders have already been received today alone. The guy asks if she intends to engage only in trade during preparation for the festival. But the main character only waves her hand and says that we also need to prepare a plan to fight the spirit. She sighs and says that there is definitely too much to do, and she doesn't even know how she can manage it all. Some time ago, the crown prince summoned the main character. He asks if there is still no progress in preparations for the festival. The girl only smiles a little puzzled, because she has nothing to answer. And the guy gets up at the table and says that even though the young lady is Tara's friend, that's the only reason he can trust her. The main character says that this is how the conversation with the employer went, who gave her a scolding for nothing. But suddenly, Shirabi starts coughing, and a young man with purple hair asks if she's really okay, but the main character tells him that everything is fine. Then one of the gardeners comes up to them and tells Miss Shirabi that they have finished all the preparations as she asked. They placed pots of sprouts along the entire street. Now the young lady realizes that the final touch remains. So she decides to invest some strength. The girl uses her ability. She calls the plants to hear her voice and grow. The young lady tells them to bloom their buds for those who are looking forward to it and to decorate this holiday with the shine of gold. The main character continues this ritual and the entire street is covered with flowers. The gardeners are shocked by this and they simply have no words. People are also surprised because the flowers bloomed in the blink of an eye. But only Tara is worried about Shirabi. He asks if she has used up too much power. However, the main character only descends to the floor. She puts her power into one stream. And a moment later, people at the festival can see something similar to fireworks. After this, flowers begin to fall throughout the area. Even gardeners are shocked by this. The main character breathes heavily and says that she did what she should have done. The young lady feels a little unwell and continues to say that she did her job properly, but then she completely collapses on the floor because she has expended too much strength. A young man with purple hair walks towards Shirabi and screams her name. He places her head on his lap, and then he puts his hand on her forehead, after which the guy removes his hand and says in horror that the girl is all on fire. And if you think about it, she hasn't given her answer about the festival yet. Everything is swimming in the eyes of the main character, and one of the knights screams that the parade will begin soon. Tara looks at the young lady worriedly and tells her not to worry. He removes her hair and claims that he will take her to the room, so he asks her not to overexert herself and take a good rest. That same evening, the two of them, sitting near the window, watch the fireworks. Tara seems very happy because he can finally spend time with Shirabi. The main character also smiles sincerely. She asks how he likes the trees. The guy claims that it is very beautiful, so much so that he wants to remember this moment forever. One of the leaves falls into his hand, and the young man says that someday the festival will end, and the flowers and trees will fade. He asks, isn't Shirabi sad? But the young lady says it's not like that at all. She looks out the window and says that she is glad that the spirits are happy. The young man looks at the main character and addresses her. Then he puts his hand on her shoulder and pulls the girl closer to him. Then he leans towards her, and the main character realizes what is happening. She looks at the guy and thinks that this atmosphere is a little strange and the young man just leans towards her and kisses her on the forehead. From this, the young lady is in complete shock. She does not understand whether they are from Tara. But suddenly she wakes up in her bed. She breathes heavily and gets up. The young lady realizes that it was a dream. She, sitting on the bed, puts her hand on her head. But at that moment, the door to the young lady's room opens. It turns out to be a young man with purple hair. The guy asks if she's woken up yet, and then puts the tray of porridge on the chest of drawers. He puts his hand on the young lady's forehead and then says that even though she took the medicine, her forehead is still hot. The main character asks what kind of medicine this is and why she needs it. Tara replies that she fainted due to illness and then asks if she remembers it. The guy claims that this was to be expected because she spent two days in a dungeon 
where there is clearly no heating, and completely forgot about her health because of the festival. He claims that their young lady used too much magic yesterday. But Shirabi waves her hand and says that's not what she's talking about, and then asks where the guy got the medicine from. The same one claims that the spirits of gardens love to live next to medicinal plants. And then he went to see his mentor. Suddenly, the main character remembers something very important. She crumples the blanket in her hands and screams that she completely forgot about the festival. Then he turns to Tara and asks if it's over already. The guy replies that the festival was just great and asks if the girl is worried because she never gave her answer. The young lady cries out that of course it is, because this job required at least a thousand gold. But then the main character feels a little bad and falls face down on the bed. The first thing she sees when she opens her eyes is Tara. He turns to Shirabi and asks if she is okay. He holds the young lady to prevent her from falling onto the bed and argues that she should stay in bed a little longer. The main character remembers her dream. So she turns to the guy and asks if he is worried about her. The young man first asks what she's talking about, and then, blushing a little, he says that of course it is. Well, suddenly they hear someone's voice as the main character looks out the window. Then she sees her friend there. She says that she seems to have disturbed the guys. Shirabi asks Yuvlin if this is it, but the girl just turns back out the window and asks for forgiveness, and then tells them to continue, and she, perhaps, will go outside. From such words, the main characters instantly turn red as tomatoes and then they move away a little from each other in embarrassment. A little time later, the main character heads to the garden. Yavlin removes her hood, and the young lady can now see her face. The shaman says that they haven't seen Shirabi for a long time, but the main character only asks her friend if she has dyed her hair again, and then adds that it is too provocative. From such words, the girl gets a little angry, she says. What about Shirabi? Because it's as if she didn't dye hers, but the main character only asks if her friend's hair will fall off if they dye it so often. Yevlin just smiles and says that the main thing in this matter is good care. The girl claims that they cannot be compared with those that were before and asks if Shirabi wants to touch. After all this, the lady with golden hair asks who the guy standing next to Shirabi is because he doesn't look like an ordinary spirit. The main character looks at her companion and remembers that he is a prince, but she tries to come up with an excuse and says that this is someone like a spirit and this guy helps fight against amnesia. The lady with golden hair asks if this is true, and the main character says that there are such things. Then Yevlin sits down on the table and asks if the girl can explain why she called her so urgently, because after the breakup, they barely even kept in touch. Tara approaches the main character and asks if the girl is not just a friend, because she behaves as if they have known each other for a long time. The lady immediately says with her hair that this is really so, but five years ago, when the girl was a little younger, she tried her best not to make a sound and hid from several people. A short time later, she came out of her hiding place and checked to see if those who were chasing her had left. The young lady was then only 14 years old. The little girl says that this is too much, because not only does she run away all the time, but she is also always covered in dirt. This was a few months after Shirabi separated from her parents. Creditors unexpectedly came to their house, but when their family ran away, the baby got lost and was stuck there alone. Suddenly, someone approached her from behind and asked if the girl was a thief. When the main character turned around, she saw a lady with black hair there. Shirabi had often seen them in her world, but here she saw them for the first time. The little girl says that she is not a thief at all, but the young lady asks why then the girl is on the run. Well then she sighs and says that she will believe it, but then asks why she is being persecuted then. The girl says that her parents, but then falls silent and thinks why should she tell that girl the truth, because she looked very suspicious. The young lady was already counting how much she would be paid for the girl, so the little girl thought that the girl could turn out to be one of the mercenaries of those creditors. Therefore, the girl with pink hair asks whether, before asking questions to strangers, you shouldn't first introduce yourself. The brunette says that this is true and apologizes. She pokes the baby on the cheek and says that she is so cute. Yes, it is said so strictly. The young lady says it looks like it's getting too noisy, and claims there's an interesting situation brewing. After which, the girl says that her name is Han Su Jin, but then she remembers that it's difficult for people here to pronounce such things. The main character is shocked by this. She doesn't understand whether it seems to her or not. But the brunette only says with a smile on her face to call her Yevlin, and then asks why the little girl is so surprised. And the main character remembers this name. She asks her to repeat her name. But the brunette just bends over to her and says that if it's too difficult, then the little girl shouldn't strain herself because she said that they could just call her Yevlin. Well, the girl can't believe it 
because this hasn't happened in the last 14 years, and this name is definitely not from this world. Therefore, the main character claims that her name is Lee Ji-hyun. The brunette is a little shocked by what she heard, and the lady with pink hair only adds that she can call her Shirabi, and now she believes that she can ignore her previous words. Han Su jin whose middle name is Yevlin, like the main character, remembered her past life. In it, she was on Earth, in South Korea. She lived there as a 20-year-old girl. But the last thing she remembers is drinking with friends, and then, for an unknown reason, she died. Be that as it may, meeting Yuvlin was a salvation for the lady with pink hair. She talked to her while chewing bread. The little girl said that this is how her friend died while drinking beer, and the brunette replies that she was always just terrible when she was drunk. Well then, she asks what about her, and the main character claims that when she was coming back from a math exam, a child ran out of some building and pushed her hard. The lady with black hair just laughs and says that it looks like the girl is not very attentive. Natalie just screams, whoever is talking. The brunette gets up and says that when you want to be reborn, fate is usually favorable to you, and it's unlikely that Shirabi's destiny is to be caught by creditors. Yuvlin claims that she thought her hair color was left over from her past life. The main character just sighs and says that's how her hair is. But then he turns to the girl and says that since there is such a connection between them, maybe she will shelter her, and then asks where she lives. The brunette says that she can shelter her, so, albeit not for long, but thanks to her the main character found shelter. True, this shelter had the small disadvantage of being the headquarters of the mercenary troops of the Empire. Yuvlin opened the door and shouted to her father to see who she had brought, and then screamed that they had a guest. Now the main character remembers this. It's like she's in another world. Tara waves her hand in front of her face, and then states that Shirabi, of course, is telling a good story, but it looks like she's really daydreaming. The lady with golden hair says that her friend is always like this, and it was at that time that she decided to create a garden. At 14 they even proposed to her, and it seems that this guy's name was Matthew. Tara screams in shock whether this was a proposal, since the girl was only 14. Yevlin Jean can hold back her laughter at this. But then she tells Shirabi that since she called her, she should tell her what's going on, because smarter people don't have much free time. The main character says that she knows, but this is an urgent matter in general. The main character pulls a young man with purple hair to her and says that he is a spirit and that this is just an astral shell, but his body is also alive somewhere. The lady with golden hair asks what she is talking about and then begins to look in different directions, asking where the spirit is. But the main character just removes her hair from him and the guy immediately disappears. The lady with golden hair asks in horror if the spirit is serious, and the main character says that she thinks that he simply lost his living body, and for some reason he cannot return to it. The girl grabs her friend's hands and says that's why she needs her help. But when they come to that very forest, the lady with golden hair says that it is very far and she doesn't feel anything, then the main character says that she knew it. But the girl says that, no matter how harmful the spirit is, it is ultimately impossible to harm while being at such a distance. So if Shirabi was right, then something very serious is happening. Apparently, they will not solve this problem without the intervention of someone with very great spiritual power. Then the lady with pink hair asks if this situation can be resolved at all. Yuvlina replies that she thinks so, then Shirabi and Tara smile. But the lady with golden hair interrupts them and says that this is not an easy task, because she heard that the girl fought with this spirit. The main character says that that woman wanted to harm a person and she had to stop her, but Shirabi doesn't understand. So what? Then the young lady asks if her friend thought why the spirit of this rotting tree wanted to harm people so much. The main character is a little surprised and asks why the spirit of a rotten tree should harm people, and Yuvlin answers that this is in order to get what she deeply desires. The lady with pink hair asks what the spirit living in that tree wanted. Yovlin replies that spirits born by someone's magic tend to think like people, and the spirits that live in Shirabi's store are similar to her in character, and probably they even think like her. This is how they differ from true spirits of nature. Then the main character asks what's wrong with Togo, and the lady with golden hair answers that only spirits created by someone can desire something. People like them can create complete chaos if they listen to this desire, and there is a high probability that in order to dispel the spell on her friend, she must give this rebellious spirit what he so wants. Shirabi says that if so-and-so she has to talk to her, she sighs and says that there is no other way anyway, except to go to the palace. But Yevlin says there is another small but real problem. The main character looks at her questioningly and asks which one, and the lady with golden hair says that she is not from this country 
and will they really allow her to enter the palace? Shirabi realizes that this is indeed true. She turns to Tara, but he only says that it would be better if she herself talks to his brother. Even if the guy gives them his permission, he now seems to be lying in a coma if the girl hasn't forgotten. Then the young lady clenches her fist and turns around. She says that as they say, you need to strike while the iron is hot. Yuvlene screams what the baby is going to do. The main character turns around and says that she has decided to meet Karen Prince and get permission for Yuvlene, and therefore, until she returns, she asks to thoroughly water all the plants in the garden. Tara sighs and the golden-haired ladies are confused but the young man only takes the watering can and gives it to Yevlin. The girl looks first at the watering can, then at Tara. And the main character at this time screams that she will pay them in full, but if they work poorly, they will be left without dinner. But when the young lady approaches the palace, she meets Glem there. The servant says that during the festival, His Highness assigned her tasks so she could freely enter and exit the palace. However, now of course, he cannot meet with anyone without prior agreement. The main character says that she really, really needs it. And then Shirabi gets an idea and asks if she can give him paper and pen, after which the young lady begins to write a sheet. In it, she writes that she has found a person who can deal with the tree. She is a spirit whisperer, but came from another country, more precisely from the Zelban Empire. Shirabi asks if she can enter his palace. The servant is watching all this, after which the main character hands the sheet into Glam's hands and asks him to give it to his highness. The servant extends his hand and asks if it is urgent, since his highness is a busy man, and the main character says that this is very urgent, and then says that then she'll go because a client is waiting for her. Shirabi then returns to his home. There she is met by Tara and Yovlin. The girl holds a sheet of paper in her hands. The young man takes away your main character's purchases and tells her to come quickly. He also asks if she went to the market. The whole package is quite weighty. The main character says that she just bought all sorts of different things, and then looks at Yuvlene. The lady with golden hair says that this letter is a response from the palace. She gives it to Shirabi and says that she has not opened it yet. The main character reads the letter, and Yevlin bends over to her and whispers that while the young lady was gone, she talked to their prince. She points to Tara and says that usually they knock out a wedge with a wedge, so they can try to send a spirit to the spirit. That night they head to the palace. Glam says that as Mr. Crown Prince said this, it is true that Yevlin, the black song of the mercenaries. The main character says that this is why the servant did not have to go with them. But when the lady with golden hair comes closer to the palace, she says that things are much more serious than she thought. Shirabi asks if they can definitely send the spirit there, and Yuvlin says that since he personally has no animosity towards that spirit, she thinks there won't be any problems. The girl extends her hand and uses force. Drops of water begin to swirl around her hand, and at the same moment, the spirit of water appears. He bows down and tells Yuvlin that they haven't seen each other for a long time. The lady with golden hair asks if the spirit remembers what she told him last time. The same one claims that yes, after which he flies away and says that he will be back soon. The main character looks after him. She is a little surprised and tells her friend that they are only talking about business and it seems that they are not sending her away because the perfume is too noisy. Yevlin says that it didn't happen right away. People with pink hair think that in comparison with him in the spirit of nature, they seem like wild animals, because they are believed to have some kind of loneliness. Every time they wake Shirabi up early in the morning, screaming at the top of their lungs. However, the main character thinks that sometimes she also wants to be alone. But suddenly they notice dark energy coming from the forest. And then the spirit of water returns back. The golden-haired lady says that it looks like Togo was just kicked out, and then asks if he received an answer. The spirit says that he, of course, found out what she wants. He looks at the main character, and she asks what the spirit said. The spirit thinks that this is an absolutely insane demand, but maybe these girls can handle it after all. Therefore, the spirit of water says that what she so desires to be called the love of the creator is a feeling that is shared by the magician and the spirit he created. The brunette claimed that this is what she wants to get so badly that she is ready to die. The main character puts her hand to her forehead and says how selfish she is. Yevlin asks if there is such a move that will share this feeling with her, and the lady with pink hair says that this is the problem. She asks what if her creator has already died, and will she really need to find a necromancer? And it means that all this rot consumed the tree because its owner did not give it enough love. Shirabi says that as she thought, she will still have to go to Tara's room and see this spirit. Glam just nods and says that they already have permission, so they can do whatever they deem necessary. 
Shirabi steps forward decisively. She understands that she must convince that spirit. After that, she enters the room with Tara's body and opens the curtains. When the young lady goes out onto the balcony, she sees the same woman sitting on a tree. She sighs and turns to her. The brunette is shocked and immediately approaches Shirabi. And then he asks what's going on, and also whether she wanted to die by her hand. But the lady with pink hair only says that she found out what the spirit wants, and then claims that she can try to find this person. Well, maybe the woman will give her at least some information. But the spirit of the rotten tree only screams so that she does not laugh at her. And then he asks if the girl wants to destroy her so much that she will go looking for a man about whom she knows absolutely nothing. She looks at the lying prince and says that if she dies, then her friend will wake up. Shirabi says that she is right, even too right, because she doesn't care what to do with the woman, clean her or finish her off so that Tara can live on. However, to be honest, she always has the opportunity to destroy a woman against her will. Few people know about forced extermination, except perhaps those people who are connected with the spirit world. A person who wants to destroy a certain spirit can do this by spending half of his strength. It is believed that this part of his magic will be lost forever, and he will be weakened by half. Although there is a possibility that the power will return. But however, until now, all attempts to find a way to restore them have burst like soap bubbles. Therefore, most spirit spellcasters do not even think about performing this ritual of extermination and think about it only as a last resort when it comes to a matter of life and death. So the young lady asks if the spirit of the rotten tree wants this. After all, if so, then there is only one option that will suit everyone, because the spirit is sick. The woman clenches her fists hearing this. Shirabi says that she doesn't know why she wants to feel love like the one her creator could give her, but she wants to find out. The brunette asks if she really wants to, and the main character nods. Then the woman extends her hand to her. Tara and Evelyn are excited about their friend. But the woman with black hair only envelops her in dark energy and says that she will tell her about it. And if a girl really wants to end everything the way it would be best for both of them, then let her follow her. The main character is enveloped in this dark energy, and after a little time, her eyes become dark. After this, the young lady wakes up on the balcony of the same palace. She realizes that it seems she has not died. And then she hears sounds from behind, so the girl heads into the corridor. When she goes down the stairs, she thinks that it looks like the building where Tara is. Only everything looks a little different there. Then the girl sees energy coming from the doors, so she heads into the garden. There she sees a young man with brown hair. He greets a guest in the garden. And then, when he leaves, he puts his hand to the tree and uses his power. The main character watches this from behind the door. She looks at that tree and realizes that this is the same rotten tree. The girl thinks that it was once so beautiful and asks how it was. But she immediately comes to the realization that her voice is heard in this world. The young man turns around and then approaches the door. When he enters the building, he sees the main character there. The guy is surprised and asks if it is a spirit. And the main character realizes that he just called her a spirit. The girl wonders if he knows her, but the brown-haired man only admires. He examines the young lady from all sides and says that this is the pink-haired spirit. He asks from what flower she came from, or is she a free spirit of nature? The main character thinks that, by the way, this guy is very noisy. The young man turns around and sighs and says that he definitely didn't create someone like her. Shirabi understands that the guy is fine without her answers. The same one turns around and says that he thinks that she does not have any special abilities. After which he kneels and turns to heaven. The guy says that the day has come when he met the spirit of nature. The main character relaxes a little and asks if he is a spirit charmer. The young man says that she guessed right, also claiming that he is a court spellcaster and his name is Caliph. The guy shakes her hand and says it's nice to meet you, but the main character's gaze falls on something else. She sees a tree there with pink petals, the young man says that the girl is probably a tree spirit, not a flower spirit. He approaches the rose tree and says that it has been a long time since he saw it bloom. He also claims that the lady with pink hair looks a lot like a flower bud. The main character does not understand what the hell this is, because the Korean cherry did not exist in this world until she created it, and moreover, Caliph. This is the name of a spellcaster who lived several centuries ago. He was very famous among his colleagues. The guy even wrote his own autobiography to share his knowledge with others. Especially with people like her, spellcasters capable of understanding plant spirits. Apart from this book, there is practically no information left about him. The main character turns to him and says that she has a question. The guy claims that it looks like she was recently born, and she is interested in a lot, but he asks what the girl would like to know. The young lady claims that he said that he did not create her, 
and therefore assumed that she was unlikely to have any special power, so she asks what that means. The guy approaches the tree and claims that he has been taking care of it lately. After this, his spirit appears from the tree. The main character understands that this is the same woman from the rotten tree. And the guy says that the spirit living in him has two abilities at once. The first is the gift of showing what she herself saw, and the second is allowing another person to personally experience the events of her life. Shirabi realizes that she, too, can grow trees. However, spirits have never yet developed special skills. Her two abilities are quite similar, but they are inherently different. It turns out that the main character was able to end up there thanks to her powers. Caliph's voice pulls her out of her thoughts. The guy claims that he will go and come back tomorrow. He also says that then they can all have fun together and says goodbye. After this, Shirabi and the woman made of wood are left alone. A lady with green hair addresses the main character. She says Caliph said the girl was born recently. The main character remembers that moment and realizes that the woman heard their conversation. And the spirit of the tree only continues and says that if she suddenly wants to ask something, who can contact her at any time because now it's spring, so she never sleeps. The lady with green hair looks at the footprints and says that Caliph also promised to come every day. The main character leans against a tree and yawns. She thinks that she also wants to sleep. Looking at the world through the eyes of spirits, she realized some things. They cannot stray far from their tree, and their time flows incomparably faster than human time, but all they can do is just stay in place, until someone calls them. When spring comes, the main character wakes up. She stretches out from her sleep, but when she turns around, she sees the same lady behind her. She looks very upset. The woman says that Caliph still does not come. The main character asks how long he has been gone and thinks how much time has passed. The woman with green hair asks what she is talking about and wasn't the girl waiting for him. The main character says that it was winter and she slept all the time. But the woman just grabs her by the hands and asks how this is even possible because the spirit of nature. But suddenly one person approaches them from behind. The woman with green hair turns around. And when she sees him, she immediately smiles. She joyfully screams the name Caliph and then immediately runs to him and hugs him. The guy apologizes because he said that he promised that he would visit them more often. The spirit of the tree says that everything is fine because he will come more often from now on. The girl asks if this is so. The main character, looking at him in shock, understands that from the side of a spirit that has been living for hundreds of years, people die too early. Caliph says that he is there today to give them the last gift. The main character realizes in horror what he is talking about. She comes a little closer. And the man uses his powers and various plants immediately sprout in the garden, after which the guy falls lifeless. The woman with green hair cannot hold back her tears. She sobs in despair because Caliph was the most important person in her life. The main character understands her pain, but even after that, time continued to pass. Unlike other spirits in nature, the one that was created by the Caliph could not fully come to terms with his death. When two guys were walking in the garden, they noticed an ebony tree. One of them asked if this tree was angry. He came closer to it and said that he would not be able to bring it back to life, and perhaps insects had infested it and ate it from the inside. The guy asks if it would be better to just cut it down without waiting for spring. The other agrees with him, but notices something strange. He tells his friend that his hand has turned black. The blonde doesn't understand what his colleague is talking about at first, but, and then he turns and looks at his hand, but while he is doing this, the spirit of a rotten tree appears behind him. The guys are frightened by this and immediately begin to run away, but their attempts are in vain. All efforts to get rid of this tree were unsuccessful, be it fire or poison, so it has been with the attempts of any capable man. The spirit of the rotten tree realized that no one understood how she felt after losing her owner. Even the shkets he raised simply forgot about him. The girl thinks whether this is even possible here and how... After the loss of the owner, you can continue to live as if nothing had happened. But one day she felt someone walking in the garden. She turned around to look. And this turned out to be Prince Tara. The guy was walking through the forest with the servants. The young man claimed that he wanted this palace because he liked the local garden. Glim turns to his highness and says that it is quite dangerous there. But the prince does not listen to him and says that the trees located in this garden are familiar to him and they are similar to those that were in the mansion where he and his brother lived for some time, after which the main character watches the guy enter his new palace. The spirit of the rotten tree says that the girl also lives there for quite a long time. A woman comes down from a tree. She says she doesn't want to be there anymore after sacrificing someone. She says that the lady with pink hair, 
other plants around her, and other people are suffering from her. The woman says that if the girl is also a spirit that has existed for several centuries, she asks if she can finish her off before she becomes even more annoying. The main character asks what she is talking about. The woman says that they are forcing her to do this because it will have a bad effect on her, but people will continue to try to get rid of it, so in any case, the woman will not be able to hold out for long. The spirit of the rotten tree says that if they all fail or give up, then nothing will work out. The main character looks at the woman. Now she understands why she couldn't commit suicide. After all, this is all because Tara is not one of those who will thoughtlessly cut down trees just because they are ugly. The guy kept growing. This spirit's wish for death was not fulfilled and her time was wasted. The main character, watching the guy, says that he has grown a lot and the brunette says that the girl will soon die. The main character asks what she is talking about, but the spirit of the rotten tree tells her to look at her hands. When the young lady looks at them, she sees that they are gradually starting to disappear. But suddenly, she hears someone heading into the garden. The servant asks where his majesty is going, and the guy claims that he will take a short walk and will return soon. Then the woman says that that boy, if they call him a prince, it means he has some meaning for the people. She claims that then people will want to get rid of her without any problems, even if it means sacrificing only them. The woman says that it seems that the girl also has little time left, and instead of being left alone, even without a relative ready to finish you off, it would be better now to take his soul and leave. Therefore, the woman immediately heads to their rotten tree. She emits some dark energy. The prince, feeling it, wonders where this sweet smell comes from. The lady with pink hair screams at him to stop and screams if she can really touch his soul like that. But the woman says that no matter what, people must face danger, and the young man was always on the alert, so it's best to finish him off now. The woman is already directing her powers at him, but the main character comes between them, as a result of which she is injured by these dark forces. The woman is shocked by this, and Shirabi only turns to the prince and sees that Togo's hand has already turned black. She immediately shakes him and shouts for Tara to come to his senses. She asks if he wanted to die. But then you say that if he is really no longer alive, then let him come to his senses quickly. The young man looks at his hand and asks what is happening. The main character continues to scream and tells him to quickly get out of this body and go to her. The guy is shocked at first by this, but still does as she said. Soon the servants run up to his highness the prince. The main character grabs a lady with black hair. She cries out to the prince about Shirabi's flower garden. The girl begins to dissolve and tells him to be sure to remember Shirabi's flower garden. After this, the young lady wakes up on the sofa. She gets up and looks where she is now. But the first thing she sees is His Highness the Crown Prince. The guy asks if she woke up, and then he says that the girl manages to sleep even in such cold weather. He claims that he wanted to take her to the bedroom, but there were too many people to notice. The main character dusts off her dress and says that it's okay. Apparently because the sofa is made of good material, her lower back does not hurt. She smiles and says it seems better than the bed in her house. After which the girl heads to the door, and the prince asks if she is leaving already. If so, when will she come again? The main character turns around and says that she needs to find out something, but nevertheless, she will look at him within a week. The guy with ruby hair asks if she and that girl will come by. He then raises his hand to call the servant. Glam comes up and tells his highness that he is listening. The crown prince tells him to act according to the situation and at the same time assign the young lady a knight to accompany her to the appointed place. Servant says it will be done. After this, when the young lady heads down the corridor, she sees a familiar knight there. He greets my lady with a smile. Then he takes her to her shop. The main character thanks Togo for accompanying her and wishes her a safe journey. The golden-haired lady asks who that guy is, and Shirabi replies that it's a knight they know a little. But the main character claims that this is not the case because when she entered, she noticed an extremely unpleasant man standing in front of the door, so she asks who it is. The golden-haired lady turns around and says that it became quiet there for a while, while the imperial knight was here. But it seems that the man came to Shirabi. The main character asks if this is for her, and Yuvlin replies that, yes, and this is most likely a client of the flower garden. The main character says that the garden is now, but before he can finish speaking, he hears someone banging on the door. The man knocks with all his might and screams for the girl to quickly open the door. He screams that he knows perfectly well that there is someone there. And then she shouts that the client is waiting outside, and she has the nerve to pretend like she doesn't know anything. After which he loses his temper and breaks through the door with his foot. The main character is shocked by this. She understands that that freak broke the door. 
after which she immediately opens the doors and asks what he allows himself. The guy screams that no matter how much he called, no one bothered to answer. Shirabi is also furious and says that there must have been an announcement that they were temporarily closed and not working. She says that she shouldn't barge in like that, but the man just laughs and says, doesn't he know that her client is the king himself? The main character thinks how impudent he is. She says that, however, in her store, she is the queen. The girl looks at his badge and says that because he thoughtlessly broke into a closed store, this can be considered an attempted robbery. And the fact that he broke the door also constituted an encroachment on private property. In addition, the guy is not a regular customer. She asks if he is an employee of Count Pripania. Shirabi asks if he could have guessed that for noble families with whom trade is regularly carried out, there is a separate way to contact. The man doesn't know what to answer to this, and the main character says that no matter how noble the family is, if they enter into a relationship like this, then there can be no question of any offer of cooperation. The girl turns around and says that she will tell the butler about today's incident, so that he should be more careful in future. People begin to whisper. One of them says that the same cost of the damaged door will be charged to that family. The girl closes the door and says that the garden will resume work next week, so even if they are in a hurry, she would appreciate it if they came at this time. The lady with pink hair says that she needs to quickly deal with all this and return the trading business to its original state. She sits on the table and says that pestering authorities and intelligence officers are showing up there. The lady with golden hair asks which scouts we are talking about. Shirabi looks at her and remembers something about it. A short time ago, in the royal palace, she met a knight with purple hair. The same one greeted Milady. The main character happily says that they haven't seen each other for a long time, and then she apologizes for the incident at the festival. The knight puts his hand on her head and says that everything is in order because he was told that the young lady fainted. He invites the main character to talk along the way because he must protect her and he would also like to ask her about something. On the way, the young lady asks what he wanted to ask her, and the guy thinks a little. And then he asks if the young lady were offered to go to another country, what would she do? Shirabi asks if he is talking about intelligence officers, and then asks which country exactly. The guy says that this is the quality of his guess, but for example, what about the Varabi's empire? The lady with pink hair notices that he is being too specific. But the young man claims that he was only setting an example, because my lady is very talented. Now the main character is sitting on her chair and says that there was just one thing. She says that she hasn't opened a store for a long time, so the man isn't the only one who's unhappy about it. The golden-haired lady says that the point is that these are not the last flower gardens in the area. People who are going to have the work done elsewhere have already found the right gardener. Those who will be waiting for the store to open are probably hoping that she will be able to somehow cope with their orders. The main character opens the door and decides to end this as quickly as possible. When she enters the garden, she is immediately greeted by fairies. They ask Shirabi if something happened. The main character only turns to them and asks if they are suffering from a lack of love. But the fairies only ask what it is. The lady with pink hair wonders how to explain this. She asks the fairies if they know the rotten tree located in the imperial palace. She says that she means the doha of that tree. After this, the main character explains the whole situation. The fairies say that then, from the very beginning, she needed to explain step by step, because how do they know when a girl, out of the blue, talks about some kind of lack of love? But the girl just screams that even if she explains it like a dog, they still won't understand. But the fairy just looks at each other and wonders what doggy style means. The main character puts her hand on her forehead and decides to simply remain silent. But one of them says that one way or another, perhaps her guess about the lack of love is correct. The girl said that the spirit that was born in the hands of the caliph has two abilities. If this was the case, he probably wanted more attention than others. If it is a spirit born in the hands of a person, then the stronger it is, the deeper its connection with the elemental. However, human life is too short for this spirit. Therefore, even after the death of the owner, he will not be able to come to terms with this. Maybe it was because she wondered if she would find him again if the guy was destined to be born again. Shirabi then asks what she should do, but the fairy with a serious expression on her face tells her to get rid of her. After all, the girl said that such a powerful spirit needs love so much that it is ready to kill itself. If the lady with pink hair participates in this, she may also die. The main character wilts a little. She says that she also wants to leave. But there are reasons why this is impossible. Moreover, she cannot leave her because the woman is very similar to them. The fairies are shocked by this. The main character told her to stop, but even these little spirits that are in flower pots 
know what the spirit of a rotten tree has to endure, because they had exactly the same heart to take care of the owner who woke them up and raised them. The fairy says that Shirabi can leave on her own. The main character doesn't understand what she's talking about. And the fairy claims that she said that a woman wants to be loved by someone who has similar energy to the person who created and raised her. In this case, wasn't it about the love of the caliph himself? After all, Shirabi has energy that is similar to the energy of caliph. The main character looks at her hands and asks if this is possible with her strength. She tells the fairies a little sadly not to be the same, because they cannot become the same as the spirit of the rotten tree. Even if she disappears later, the fairy just sighs flies closer to the main character's ear and whispers something there. This makes the young lady smile sincerely. And later that night, she and Yavleen go to that garden. The crown prince says that as the girl said, all the exits from the imperial palace are locked, and the people from the palace also have all the servants left, apart from the essentials. The guy with ruby hair asks if she can handle it, and Shirabi replies that she will try until she succeeds, and then you say that this is not so, and says that she will cope with it no matter what. She slaps her cheeks and says she's off then. The spirit of water is watching them from above. He uses his powers and disperses dark energy. Yuvleen tells the main character to run away immediately if she senses danger, and let her not think of being a hero in vain. The lady with pink hair smiles and says that she didn't mean to. The girl asks if she is not one of those who does only good things for others. She then looks ahead and thinks that she will be fine because she promised Tara that she would definitely come back. Suddenly, a lady with black hair appears. She says that since the girl returned there again, Tony really wants to say that she found what she wants so badly. The young lady says that she herself is a bit of a genius, so she does not forget what she was once told. However, she says that if a woman wants to get what she wants, then could she calm down the energy that comes from her a little? Although the woman looks unperturbed, in reality, she can barely restrain herself from snatching what she wants. The woman waves her hand, and the energy dissipates. Then the main character sighs and comes closer to the tree. The girl understands that if from the very beginning this was the only solution, then she must clarify this. So she spreads her arms to the sides and tells the spirit of the rotten tree to come to her. The woman is a little shocked by this and asks what the girl is going to do. But the main character uses her powers and says that this is what the woman wants. Although it is not clear what was the cause and what was the effect, part of this power came from him. The last moments of Caliph are the energy of life. If a girl loved her master so much, she would be able to recognize him. A small clot of energy flies up to a woman with black hair, and when she touches it, her hand gets rid of a black mark. The spirit of the rotten tree asks Caliph if this is it. Her legs immediately begin to move, and then the woman runs up and hugs the main character, she still has black energy, which is a little harmful to the main character. The brunette sobs and says that she really missed Caliph. The main character apologizes. She says that she is not the Caliph, because unfortunately, the dead do not return. The main character says that even knowing this, the woman could not cope with her loneliness, an empty palace and gardeners who left this place. Since then, no one has returned. The woman is a tree planted to please the eyes, and she must have wanted people to look at her when she was blooming beautifully. The girl tried her best to grow very beautiful flowers that smelled delicious. She told everyone to come see and take a walk at the same time, but no one was there, no one heard her call. The lady with green hair asked for someone to come. She soared high, and when I did this I saw the maid. The spirit of the tree shouted to her to come, but the girl did not hear it. Then the tree spirit used a little wind, but the maid only asked what was going on with the weather and ran away. The green-haired lady understood that ordinary people did not hear her voice, but Caliph was special, and now she was left completely alone. Then that despair settled in her. Now the woman is shedding her black tears, and at this time the spirit of water is trying with all her might to drive away the dark energy. The main character hugs a woman and thinks that there really is no limit to this. The girl thought it would be hard, but she doesn't understand how long it will last. The spirit of the rotten tree says just a little longer, and the main character wonders what she is talking about. But then he sees that the young lady's hair is beginning to return to its normal state. After that, she says with a smile on her face that they should have met earlier. The main character says that if the girl is destined to be reborn, she hopes that then the spirit of the tree will grow in love. The young lady knows that beings like spirits are not meant to live another life, but she couldn't say anything else. Shirabi thinks that aside from her origins, her life is too much. The young lady says they have to go now that the woman with green hair has been there too long. 
The tree spirit thanks the main character with a sincere smile and then disappears forever. Afterwards, Yuvlin approaches the young lady. She says that it wasn't that difficult and then asks if Shirabi is okay. But the girl just collapses on the floor. The lady with golden hair screams her name, but everything floats before her eyes. Several years ago, when Shirabi was working in a mercenary unit with Yuvlin, it was then that she decided to become a gardener and open a flower shop. But in those days, another important event happened. The main character tried to trim one of the branches of the bush. She put all her strength into this, but this only caused the scissors to break. The main character was shocked by this. She didn't understand what to do about it and whether it could be fixed. But after a little time, she was already standing in the middle of the square for more than an hour. The young lady wondered where she even was. It seems to her that last time she saw a forge on the right side of the road. But now there is no one in that place at all. The girl thinks that, moreover, she has walked the streets for so long that she no longer remembers the way back. So the young lady found herself in a foreign land. She understands that only she could get lost in three pines. But suddenly, someone puts a hand on the girl's shoulder, and this makes the little girl scared. However, when she turns around, she sees a young man with brown hair there. He apologizes to the baby and says that she must have been scared. The guy asks if she is okay. He claims that he simply saw that the girl continued to stagnate in one place and asked if she was lost. He says that the baby also carries such huge scissors with her, so he asks if it's hard for her or not, and then offers his help. The main character says that it's not hard for her at all, but the guy just smiles. After this, the girl finally decides to ask if he knows where the forge is. Then the guy takes her to the building where the blacksmiths work. The girl looks around, and when they come in, one old blacksmith asks what Matthew's fate is like there and whether he broke his ball again. But the young man says that everything is not like that. He puts the main character in front of him and claims that today this girl was desperately wandering along the road. So he brought her from there because she has a business. The man approaches her and asks the little girl why the forge. The main character is a little embarrassed, and then he shows the blacksmith the broken scissors. Matthew is watching her from behind. This was their first meeting. A short time later, the main character only tells Matthew to give her some water. The guy pours water into a glass and hands it to Shirabi. When the main character drinks it, she finally feels alive. The young man says that she, too, is having a hard time and asks whether it would be better to earn some money and pay off all debts as soon as possible rather than suffer in such a situation. Shirabi says that it would be nice if this debt was a few pennies, but the amount exceeds as much as 6,000 gold, so the young lady does not understand how she can make it all happen. But the guy only says that if he were with her, he could do this, because the once ruined garden began to sparkle with new colors in just two months thanks to her. The young man claims that his girlfriend can definitely become a world-famous gardener. The girl says that the guy will definitely be stung by a bee someday, and the boy only asks if this is a curse. But Shirabi replies that he speaks as if his teeth were smeared with honey. The young man just giggles and then picks one purple flower, and he puts it behind the ear of the lady with pink hair. He also asks how old the girl is. The main character understands that they have known each other for two months, but she still hasn't said her age. The girl claims that she is 14 and asks why the guy is interested in this. The young man, all red, says that he likes her, but she is still too small. The main character is shocked by this. She blushes all over and asks what he is talking about and whether he was joking. Then she tries to catch up with him and asks him to say that he is joking, but the guy only says that who knows whether he is joking or not. This was Shirabi's first memory of someone sincerely confessing their feelings to her. Although only childhood memories are associated with him, the young lady clearly remembers how they quarreled. She remembers how a guy asked her to marry him when she grows up. Then there were no ways to earn money, and a debt of 6,000 gold pieces lay on her shoulders like a huge boulder, so she could not even think about accepting someone's feelings. Now the girl thinks she would answer differently if she knew that she would be able to pay off all the debt and save money. Yuvlin can stand next to her and point to her open mouth, and the main character feeds her a cake. When the lady with golden hair feasts on it, she asks what the girl is thinking about. The main character says that it's nothing like that, and she just remembered the past. Evelyn just laughs and asks what she remembered, and is she really thinking about Matthew? Shirabi blushes and says, of course not. Tara is interested in this and asks who Matthew is. The golden-haired lady asks Tara if he knew that Matthew was their first love, Shirabi. The main character at the same moment screams that everything is wrong, and the guy was unrequitedly in love with her. Yuvlin asks, didn't the two of them spend too much time with each other, even though they were working at the time? 
Tara just turns around and says that it's true. At that moment, one thought arose in the main character's head. Looking at Tara's profile, she wondered if there was anyone she could like right now. But the girl immediately grabs her fork and stabs a whole piece of cake and then mercilessly eats it, after which the girl claims that this relationship is a thing of the past. And even if Matthew confesses again who she is, she's not going to reciprocate. Yovlin just smirks and asks if it's true. That same evening, the main character lies on the ground and looks at the stars. But suddenly, something obscures her view. It turns out to be Tara. The guy claims that the girl will catch a cold if she lies on the floor. But the main character says that she has quite a strong immune system. She worked too hard at that time, and that's why things turned out that way. After this, the main character says that tomorrow, the guy will finally be able to return to his body. Tara says that's true. Then Shirabi tells him to visit her from time to time, because he will no longer see the spirit with his own eyes. But the guy doesn't let the lady with pink hair finish. He lies down on the grass next to her, and then claims that he came to look at her. The young man says that there is a lot of things that he would like to tell, but he hasn't even really told her his story. The main character asks if he talks about how he lived as a prince. The young man says that perhaps her idea differs from reality, but she and her brother are considered exiles from an early age. The guy asks if the girl remembers the burnt mansion they went to on the day they first met, but it was there that she and her brother spent their childhood. The main character is a little shocked by this. And after that, Tara continued the story about his childhood. He told a story that he had not touched on before, about how he almost drank poison, and then about how I almost stabbed him with a mercenary dagger, and then how he lived day after day receiving dozens of threats, even when he was called to the palace. Due to the growing fear at the sight of his father occupying the imperial throne, he could not utter a word. The guy was a pathetic person who always lived under someone's protection, without a single drop of courage. So he lived until that very moment when he touched that rotten tree. Then the young man had a dream. He didn't really see Shirabi's face, but he immediately left and went to Shirabi's flower garden. If her boyfriend had not met her that day, then most likely the end would have overtaken him. Looking back, the young man realizes that he has experienced enough difficulties. But what if he had to go through all of this to eventually meet Shirabi? The guy says he thinks this theory is true. He turns to Shirabi and then extends his hand to her. The lady with the pink ones takes him by the hand, and the guy claims that he really wants it, that the day has come when he could meet her not in this state, but as a living person, to talk about your true feelings. The main character understands that she will definitely cope because she made a promise to Tara. Now the main character thinks that since that woman was a tree spirit and the main character a gardener, this separation was apparently destined to happen. The girl lies all exhausted and wonders whether the spirit of the tree has found freedom. But when she opens her eyes, she also thinks her stomach hurts. Someone hands her a glass of water. The main character is about to say thank you, but then she sees that it is His Highness the Crown Prince and says that she thanks him. The young man with ruby eyes says that he should be grateful for nothing. He holds out his hand and asks if the girl will drink, and she says that she will and immediately drinks a full glass. Then the Crown Prince says that the tree is completely dry. The main character says that all this is because the spirit has left him and most likely flowers will never bloom or leaves will appear on that tree again. Shirabi crushes the glass in his hands and asks if that tree will be cut down. His Highness says that he doesn't know, because if it no longer creates problems, then it doesn't matter to him whether they cut it down or leave it. Besides, he is not the owner of this palace, and Tara will decide what to do with him. Then the main character remembers something important. She asks how long she lay unconscious and how Tara is doing. The guy with ruby hair only says that he sent a doctor to him, and if you think like that, then it's time to slowly come to your senses. He asks if they should go and visit him, and at this time the young man lies in his chambers. But suddenly he begins to regain consciousness. The guy realizes that apparently he has already completely returned to his body. He has not felt this pain for a long time. But when he looks forward, he sees that during the time he was lying there, his bangs had grown noticeably. And then he remembers that Shirabi, after all, strongly ordered him not to go inside. That's why he was outside the Imperial Palace, but a short time later, he noticed a flash of green energy. He did not return immediately after this. The young man tries to get out of bed and go to Shirabi, but he immediately falls off his feet. At this time, he hears someone heading down the corridor. It turns out to be the crown prince. The guy is holding Shirabi in his hands, after which he sits her down on a chair and asks if the girl hasn't been using her powers for two months, so he asks her to sit, because it's likely that she'll get dizzy. 
Tara feels a little awkward and sits back on the bed. The guy with ruby hair says that they are both very tired, so they shouldn't talk too long. Then the crown prince turns around and says he's gone. Tara and Shirabi are a little embarrassed, because now they are alone. The guy looks at the trembling hands of the main character and immediately lowers his head, feeling guilty about this. But the young lady just calls out to him and says that, in fact, she has not died yet, but is full of strength and energy, so she asks if he can stop worrying so much already. The guy says that it seems that Shirabi's condition leaves much to be desired. The young lady asks why, but the guy asks whether the energy of a person with such abilities can decrease so absurdly, because now he sees that the main character exudes very little of this energy. But the young lady says that this is temporary, and hasn't the guy noticed that this happens every time she loses consciousness? The young man, Zhenya blushes a lot, and says that he apparently tormented her greatly, but the main character does not look offended. She just puts her hands on his cheeks and says that nevertheless, it's good that he's back. The guy agrees with this, and the young lady continues, and says that besides, she also benefited from it. After all, if this had not happened, then perhaps she would have lived her entire life in ignorance of that which disturbs the soul of the spirit she created. Therefore, she tells us with a bright smile on her face that everything is in order. Tara looks at her a little flushed. The main character just yawns. She has spent so much energy that her body is weak, and sleep takes its toll. It was then that Tara decided that next time he would definitely protect this girl. And about a month later, he again visited Shirabi's garden. A lot of time had passed since Tara's awakening, and the main character's powers, which had been completely exhausted, could only do nothing but sleep. The work in the store exceeded 15 days, so that after it was completed it could be opened again. The main character opens the door to her shop and tells customers to get in line, because today only 10 people can place an order. One of the guys asks how it is that he has been standing there for three hours already, but the young lady says she can't offer more because of the situation in the Imperial Palace. Assam thinks it is appropriate to send away guests due to the preparations that are being carried out in the palace. Then the guy asks her to at least give her a number. Well, the young lady just tells him to come back today, because she will remember everyone who waited in line. And then someone points out that people came from the palace. People in the crowd are a little disappointed, but disperse. And the main character can finally breathe. After this, Tara approaches her. The two of them then head to the shop. The main character serves the prince tea while she counts the plants. The order received from the imperial family involved cultivating plants on site, and holding a celebration in honor of Tara's recovery. The young lady counts 14 plants and realizes that she is finally finished, but then she turns to the guy and asks if something happened. She claims that he arrived in a sparkling carriage and was also born in beautiful clothes. The young man chuckles, and then he hands the main character two envelopes. Shirabi asks what it is, and the young lady replies that it is an invitation to a celebration. The young lady says that quite a lot of ordinary people pay to have fun at the aristocrats' celebration. She claims that she is a participant in the celebration of aristocrats and therefore can disappear without the mice and birds recognizing. But the prince tells her not to worry so much because it will be a masquerade ball. The guy says that the sick emperor wants to see her, and instead of calling her personally, he used this method. He claims that the appearance of the eyes is of great importance, and if a young lady joins the celebration, it will be difficult to know who is talking to whom. The young lady looks at the sheet and realizes that it is an invitation from the emperor himself. From the very beginning, she had no choice but to accept the invitation. It's a masquerade ball. In other words, a celebration at which masks are allowed. Taking part in such an event, most aristocrats would not even think that an ordinary shirabi, a girl from the people, was wandering next to them. The lady with pink hair understands that this is obviously Tara's point of view, because she and the emperor have nothing in common. Therefore, if a girl comes to the palace and receives condemnation from people, this will no longer concern him. The guy sighs and tells the main character to take into account that this is an imperial order. The main character says that she obeys and addresses the guy as his highness. The young man smiles and says, no matter who, but he doesn't like to hear such words from her. Then the girl puts the sheet closer to his face and tells him to then return to work in their store. When he is absent, there are not enough workers. The young lady thinks that the word masquerade ball suits girls from the aristocracy very well. The girl imagines aristocrats talking among themselves and wonders if it always happens like this. Beautiful outfits, drinking alcohol and dancing. The young lady remembers her childhood, and you realize that if you think about it, then since her birth, she has never indulged in fun. Shirabi calls out to Yuvlin from behind. She greets her, 
and then says that the prince has come to see her too. The girl points to the envelope in the hands of the lady with pink hair and asks what she has, and the main character says that it says that she and she are invited to the imperial palace. After all, a masquerade ball will be held. Zero goes with golden hair and immediately snatches the sheet from his friend's hands, not allowing her to finish. She asks if she was invited too. The girl claims that the name Yuvlin is also present, and the prince is a little surprised by the girl's reaction. The lady with golden hair just turns around and asks if they have come up with someone to transform into. But these two just shake their heads negatively. Yuvlin then says that in that case, they can leave it to her. The main character does not understand what she is talking about. And the girl only claims that she can make an excellent suit for her, even if you can't tell for her and for His Highness either. The guy claims that there are only 15 days left and asks if the girl will have time to sew three suits and even one for him. The lady with golden hair says that half a month is enough. She runs away from the nightingale and says that she needs to start quickly. The main character doesn't understand why the girl is so excited, and then she turns around and asks the prince if it's hard for him to be there for a long time. The purple-haired young man says that no matter what, he will come again. Then he blushes a little and fidgets with his fingers. Apparently, he has something in mind, but cannot decide. However, suddenly the guy gets up from his seat and kisses the main character on the cheek. The young lady turns red as a tomato from this, because it took her by surprise. The guy leaves the shop and waves to Shirabi. A short time later that same day, the main character goes out into the garden to water the flowers. But all it does is spill water on the path. The girl, apparently, was thinking about something. The main character thinks about Tara and that kiss on the cheek, and also about how he said that he would come again, because on the day of the ball, they would send a carriage. The young lady is still standing like a vegetable, the swindler behind them is whispering. One of them asks the second if she thinks that their mistress is somehow thoughtful. Not so long ago she worked tirelessly, but now she just stands there in prostration. Another fairy says that the girl began to behave rather strangely when this guy with lilac hair returned. They look at the main character and ask if she shouldn't bring him again, but the second fairy says that she heard that the guy is a principal, and if only they could do whatever they want. The lady with pink hair turns to the fairies. They respond and think about what the girl wants to ask them. But the main character, only blushing a little, asks if she should go to the Imperial Palace as an employee. The fairies are horrified by this. They ask if she is lying. Because if everything was as before, how could anyone say something like that? The fairies understand that if everything was as usual, Shirabi would never have had such thoughts because she so vehemently refused to become the Imperial Gardener. The main character, after some thought, lies face down on the table. She claims that this is not the case as she thought. The girl understands that the absence of only one person makes her think about this. Young ladies think how complicated everything is. She doesn't know what this feeling is, but everything seems so complicated. At this time, the third fairy flies up to them. She asks what's the matter, and the other two fairies look at each other. At this time, the prince is talking with a servant in his office. The guy says that in this case, he will raise this issue on the agenda. And then he bows, and says that His Highness did a great job. After that servant leaves, the young man rises from his chair and heads to the window, after which he goes out onto the balcony and looks at the dried tree. The guy doesn't understand that a whole month has already flown by. During this time, a lot of things happened so that he now understands why people are shouting about moving the prince's palace. Glam was especially persistent, so much so that he even managed to convince the emperor. However, when the guy looks at that garden, Thoughts about this girl involuntarily creep into his head. Tara wonders if he would be selfish if he said that he wanted to continue being there. Suddenly, he sees a pink ray of light and thinks that even now everything is exactly like that day when he was next to her. The fairy flies up to the guy and tries to reach him, but he thinks that this is a spirit that cannot be seen. But then he realizes that he sees a spirit and is immediately surprised. The guy rubs his eyes and says that it seems to him that something is wrong with his eyes but he's not using the ability right now. The young man asks why he sees a fairy, but the little girl is only angry. She says that what is visible is visible and asks why he does not trust his own eyes. Afterwards, she tugs at his suit and tells him to talk to her. Tara realizes that this seems to be a spirit from the Shirabi flower garden. Not only does she look like a housewife, but she also has exactly the same personality. The guy asks if something happened. The little girl just gets angry and says if he's asking. Then she starts pulling Togo by the hair and screams why he doesn't appear in the garden, because now he doesn't look like he's in pain. The guy just puts his hand on his head 
and then realization comes to him, and he asks if Shirabi sent the fairy all the way there. He also asks if the baby got all the way there alone. The fairy says that he thinks correctly, because after he left, Shirabi's condition became terribly strange, so she came to find out. But the young man only asks what this strange state means, and the fairy answers, and it means something. After all, the girl does work that she is not even asked to do, and despite the fact that she is receiving more and more guests. And when he opens his eyes in the morning, he does nothing but work until he goes to sleep. The prince is embarrassed, and wonders if this is because he is no longer with her. After which he asks if the fairy came, because the girl needs a lot of money. But then the little girl just starts hitting the prince on the head, and screams that his head is only thinking about this. Tara tries to object, but the fairy only asks what it means, but also whether he thinks that from now on, it's wrong to come to her more often. The guy says that maybe this is so, and the fairy asks if he will come even in the state of mind he was before. But the guy says that even if he goes there like this, it will be impossible for Shirabi to see him, although she saw him when he fell under the hot hand of the spirit of the rotten tree, because then he was filled with the power of the spirit. But if you don't have spiritual abilities like he has, then it will be difficult to see such a ghostly appearance. The fairy understands that this guy's spiritual abilities are slightly different, but since the spirits have been using and tempering their abilities for many years, they can see him. But then the guy just asks if everything will be okay because the fairy has flown so far. He says that Shirabi's power influences the garden spirits, and if she wanders around like this, she will remain a burden to Shirabi. But the fairy only asks what guy's opinion about the young lady, because the range of Shirabi's abilities is unrealistically huge. When such a small spirit like her flies such distances, it's comparable to ships at sea. Then the fairy remembers something. She flies up to Tara and says that there is a way. The young man asks what method she is talking about, and the fairy continues and says that she means a way that will help him talk to Shirabi. Then other fairies fly out of the bushes, and the little girl with pink hair says that they will convey to him what Shirabi says and to her his words. The young man asks what she is talking about, and the fairy claims that both he and Shirabi can see them. And if the lady with pink hair is not able to see him with her own eyes, then they must listen to what he has to say and convey it to her. The guy thinks that this method will really work if he just wants to praise her, but he remembers that evening and realizes that he will not be able to say the most important words in this way, but he thinks that it doesn't matter if he at least doesn't have to wait continuously. He thanks the fairy and says that even though it will be difficult now since he needs to finish some things, but he will come on time, so let them wait for him. The fairies smile, and then flying away, they say that they understand, but then they tell him not to be too late, and everything else, he must come before Shirabi goes crazy. But when they fly away, the young man only says that he doesn't think that she can go crazy because of him. Then the young man turns around and returns from the balcony to his office. But someone is already waiting for him there. The guy asks if this is Hyungnim. Tara apologizes and says that he has something to think about, but he never finishes his sentence. The crown prince looks at his brother and thinks about that lady with pink hair, after which he turns to Tara and says that all the obligatory matters are over, so he can go out, but only if he can stand up for himself. A young man with purple hair with a smile on his face asks what he means, and the crown prince only recalls his conversation with the emperor and claims that his majesty the emperor allowed it. He said that Tara was already quite an adult and therefore could not hide in the palace forever, and thanks to what happened, he said that he realized the fact that the guy is a little boy in order to be so distracted about him. Tara just smiles even brighter. And when the crown prince looks at his brother, he remembers the past. Previously, during a fire, the crown prince helped him get away from the burning building. And after that, they tried to poison Tara. Due to the existence of a mysterious enemy who tirelessly ambushed him, the young man was constantly in a depressed state. However, now he himself wants to go out. The purple-haired young man says that, to be honest, he's done with work for today, so he asks if it's okay if he comes out. The guy with ruby hair sighs. He takes the documents in his hands and tells him to come after a more thorough study. Afterwards, they go downstairs, and Tara says goodbye to her brother. The ruby-haired guy uses his ability and says that his brother has the only way to leave the Imperial Palace. Tara, with a smile on her face, says that she knows, and a few days later, it's time for the ball. The main character wanders around her garden and arranges plants, she curses Yuvlin. The girl with golden hair said that she could not work on a day like today because she needed to dress up the prince. And the young lady asks if this is the end, 
and then thinks about whether she should close the door, but someone calls out to her from behind and asks her to wait. A little time later, the main character is heading in a carriage. Ordinary people, despite this, say that it looks like this carriage is going straight to the palace. The only one who can't calm down is the young lady sitting in it. The girl understands that her choice fell on something that evokes stronger feelings and at the same time is less remarkable. Yevlin, holding a wig and a dress in her hands, argued that she was suitable for the image of the main character of a cute fairy tale, and the wig would also help hide her pink hair, which was too conspicuous. The young lady, of course, liked this outfit, because it was like the heroine from Alice in Wonderland, and Yuvlin herself was excited about creating the image. But the young woman thinks that getting involved in such an adventure right before the ball is a little dangerous. When the girl heads to the palace, the knights tell her to show her invitation. Well, one of the butlers says that he heard that this man was called by his highness himself. Glam passes by, sees this whole situation, and comes closer. The knight claims that he was told that this man was personally invited by his highness. The main character with a smile on her face says that she is glad to see Glam. He freezes for a second, and then realization comes to him. After which the man claims that he was waiting for her, his highness is expecting a young lady so they should pass quickly. As Shirabi heads down the corridor, she realizes that she has not yet gotten used to these shoes, so they are damn uncomfortable. Glam at this time says that the girl is truly incredible. If not for her voice, he would not have recognized her. The main character says that she also admires Yuvlin's skill, because the girl made her just a different person. The servant asks if she is talking about that elementalist from a foreign land, and then, when they approach the door, the servant claims that the girl is there. He bows and says that there is still a little time left before the celebration begins, so they will meet His Highness later at the venue of the ball. The main character thanks him for seeing her off, and then walks through that door. The young lady looks around, but suddenly her gaze falls on someone else. The girl sees a guy with ruby hair. Looking at him, she realizes that this is the crown prince, but the girl is shocked by this. The guy, when he sees her, smiles and says how many years, how many winters, and then asks how she is doing. The young lady remembers how she was lying on the floor and claims that everything is fine now, but the sight of his highness. But he doesn't let her finish and says that now Tara is being dressed up by an elementalist, he touches his ears and says that he really doesn't know where this character comes from. The main character understands that she is Alice and the guy is a white rabbit. The young lady wonders if Yuvleen is going to dress Tara up as characters from that opera. Then Shirabi looks at the crown prince and thinks that since this is a fairy tale from another world, he wears this costume and doesn't know what it is. But suddenly the door swings open and Yuvlin screams that this time it really is a masterpiece. The girl comes out with a young man dressed in a tablecloth and says that the young lady's face formed the basis of the outfit and she even applied makeup, so she turned out to be a talented actress. Shirabi looks at her friend and says that means she is the Black Queen and then asks why the guy is wearing a headscarf. Yuvlin claims that this is a way to present a masterpiece to the world at the right moment, and at this time, a rumor comes into the room and screams for them to come in. The guy under the scarf turns to Shirabi. He claims that he heard from the spirits that her condition is strange, and then asks if the girl is okay. The main character understands what he is talking about, and you answer that it's not that anything happened, but she just thought that she should try to live her own way. But then the main character asks what's wrong. The guy under the scarf is silent. And then he says that these are the funniest words he has heard from her in the entire time they have known each other. Shirabi clenches his fist and says that this is not funny at all, so he shouldn't say that, because this scarf could fly off him at any second. After this, they continue on their way. The young lady says that the prince seems to be very busy lately. Tara claims that he is not even able to visit the nearest store, and he only knows that it is located very close to the Imperial Palace. The guy claims that he wanted to go there. The main character understands what he is talking about, so she says with a smile on her face that she will wait, after which the two of them enter the hall. The main character is shocked. She thinks that she now understands what the world of the aristocracy is like. The young lady realizes that money is literally everywhere there. The girl takes the drink from the table, but when he turns around, the light has already gone away from the prince. The main character wonders where he went again, but suddenly, one of the servants screams that His Majesty the Emperor has arrived. The main character looks at the man with red hair and realizes that this is Tara's father. She thinks how similar these two are. But then Shirabi locks eyes with His Highness. The young lady realizes that their gazes have just crossed. The Emperor goes to the messenger 
and says that today's celebration is dedicated to the return of Tara. He says that people are enjoying the festival more than he thought, so he is very happy. The emperor raises his glass and says to have fun and not think about anything. The main character tries to step forward, but she immediately trips back over her shoe, and just as the young lady is about to fall, someone grabs her from behind. It turns out to be the crown prince. He says that the young lady apparently is not yet accustomed to the shoes, and it seems that she has grown up, but the girl's health is not to be envied. The guy with ruby hair says that when she went to prison for falsely accusing her of putting a maid into eternal sleep. Then Tara independently proved her innocence to his majesty, which is why he knows her. Hyungnim says that the girl is the first person Tara has shown such great interest in, although communicating with people is definitely not his strong point, because he is clumsy and poor at expressing his feelings. But he always does his best for her. His highness pats the main character on the back and says he just wants her to know, after which the main character goes to a crowd of girls surrounding one guy. This young man turns out to be Tara, when he sees Shirabi, he immediately approaches her, and then he approaches her ear and whispers something. The next morning, the main character looks tired, but she immediately plunges her head into a sink full of water and thinks that the guy has definitely lost his mind. The lady with pink hair is racking her brains over the question of why he did this. She remembers how last night a guy came up to her and said that there were so many people there that it was even inconvenient. He asked if she had accidentally thought about going out. The young lady asks what he is talking about. The young man says that if she doesn't want to go into the garden, then let them at least go out onto the terrace. The main character understands that he bought her up. She says that she doesn't mind, because if they stare at them like that, then they definitely won't be able to have a normal conversation. Then the two of them go out onto the balcony. The fairies immediately surround the main character and ask if she went out to get some fresh air. But the young lady just gets a little angry and tells them that she told them to watch the house. The prince says that it seems the little ones followed her. But after these words, the young lady is shocked. She immediately rushes at the guy. He smiles and asks what's wrong with her. But the main character says that she has the same question and asks if he was looking at the spirit just now. She immediately begins to paw him, checking to see if he is alive, and then asks if he is dead. When the girl looks at his hands, she says that no matter how much he said that he wanted to see the spirits, how could it be possible for the guy to turn white like that, just like the living dead? The young man only says that it's just makeup, but then he puts his hand on her face and asks her to stop because he is completely alive and well. He looks at his hand and asks if the powder Yuvlin used made his skin so pale, and then he looks at Shirabi and says that she has changed quite a bit too, after which he reaches out to her face and takes a strand of hair in his hands. The main character asks if he likes her golden hair. The guy claims that among the other ladies there are many who have blonde hair. Initially, he thought it was terribly formulaic and banal, but he claims that this color suits the main character very well. The young lady thinks that, of course, because they don't choose the hair color themselves. But the young man only pulls a strand of her hair to his face and kisses her. The main character is terribly embarrassed by this. She thinks what happened and why she behaves this way. The girl thinks that this is not the sound of her wildly beating heart right now. The young lady thinks why there is such an atmosphere and what to answer her. The guy just looks at her questioningly. The main character says that something in her throat is dry and perhaps she should drink something. Then he drinks a whole glass of wine in one gulp. Tara says that he doesn't know exactly why he began to see spirits, but he thinks that this is due to the fact that for a long time he was outside his body, and the more you use your abilities, the stronger they develop. The young man claims that he was allowed to leave the palace, the celebration will soon end, and things will more or less return to normal, and perhaps he will be able to return to the store. Shirabi asks if he really wants to go to work, but the guy says no. And then the young master comes up to her and says that he just wants to see her. Shirabi remembers that Tara said that he wants the day to come when he can meet her and confess his feelings while truly alive. The young lady looks at the prince and understands that today is the day when that very moment must come. Therefore, she immediately snatches the glass of wine from the guy's hands and drinks it in one gulp. The young man turns to Shirabi and says that it is alcohol. The main character, all red, says that she knows and asks if this is important now and then he places the empty glass on the balcony railing. The girl then approaches Tara and asks Togo if he likes her. The guy, all red, looks away and then looks back. He says that's how it is. And the main character only asks if he is saying all this because alcohol has gone to his head. The young man says that of course he drank, but only to gain courage, and now he is in his right mind. The main character is just thinking. She'd heard something like this before. 
Shirabi wonders how that guy felt then. The young lady recalls all the events that happened to her. First, it was her death and rebirth in another world as Shirabi. Then the girl met many spirits, including Lefilea, and she had to say goodbye to some of them. After this, an incident occurred with a rotten tree and the spirit of which she saved from eternal torment. The main character clutches her dress and says that she doesn't know. She claims that her soul is so empty when the guy is not around. She wants him to be near. The girl thinks that she doesn't want to say that her heart is fluttering, so she says that she is not excited. The guy clenches his fists and says that he understands everything because the girl is only 19. Tara understands the girl who lived without a guardian, who alone and steadfastly endured numerous losses, a position in which you cannot fall in love with someone at the snap of your fingers. He approaches the window that gives them a view of the hall and obscures it, after which he turns to the main character and asks if she knew that he would be a vampire, and the young lady understands that nevertheless the guy spoke. The young man comes up to her and takes her hand, after which he claims that they say that vampires drink human blood in order to preserve their youth and beauty. They are also able to charm people using magic. The guy moves even closer to her. He whispers in her ear whether she says that her heart is not fluttering, and then pushes away a strand of hair. Then he approaches her neck and kisses it tenderly. Then the guy pulls back a little, and he tells the main character that then he will drink her blood, and tells the young lady to captivate him. Shirabi is all red and does not realize what is happening now, and the guy lightly bites her neck. Then he moves away. The main character looks at him all red, but then looks away. And Tara once again says that he likes her. He claims that he does not force her, however. He slowly approaches her, and then their lips touch in a tender kiss. When the prince kisses his beloved, he feels how these feelings consume him. Their hands intertwine, and the young lady is already standing on her toes. After they break the kiss, Tara argues that she should know how long he's wanted to stand so close to her. The young man hugs Shirabi again and says that for a very long time, he dreamed of telling her about his feelings. The main character is all red. Now she can feel that Tara's heart is beating at the same speed as hers. But the young lady sighs. And after that, he pushes the prince away from him and heads towards the exit from the balcony. Tara asks if something happened, but Shirabi only claims that her throat is dry so she will go drink some water. Yuvlin is enjoying the treats from the table at this time, but after a moment, she sees that Shirabi has already arrived. The young lady hands her a piece of cake and asks if she can even imagine how awesome this cake is, and then tells her to open her mouth. But the main character ignores her and just reaches for another glass, and then dries it. Yuvlin tells the young lady that this is alcohol. The main character doesn't listen to her and just reaches for another glass. After she has already devastated more than five of these, Yuvlin asks what happened. The young lady says hers, but then goes silent, and Yuvlin excitedly tells her to continue. Well, the main character just covers her mouth with her hand and says that she's going to throw up, after which she heads out and empties her stomach behind one of the corners of the Imperial Palace. Yuvlin looks at her friend worriedly, and after that, Shirabi just lies contentedly on the ground. But when he looks up, he thinks that everything is floating before his eyes, and then she falls asleep completely. But now in the morning, remembering all this, she immediately immerses her face completely in the water. After her morning water treatments, she leaves the bathroom, but there she is immediately met by Yevlin. She asks what took Shirabi so long, because she already thought that the girl managed to choke while she was washing, but the young lady just looks away. Then the lady with golden hair comes up to her and asks if something happened between her and Tara. The main character only asks if she has to answer, which is exactly what she does, and plops down face down on the table. The girl says that on the one hand there was something between them, but on the other there seemed to be nothing special. After the main character passed out in the garden, Yuvlin tried to drag her to the restroom, but the prince stopped them and asked if they were leaving already. Fat Yuvlin says that as he can see, this girl has had too much, and she will put her down someday, and as soon as she sobers up, the girl will take her to her place. The main character screams that it's all because of work, and she's busy because, but the girl doesn't finish her sentence that way. The prince says that he will prepare a room for rest, and if the young lady is busy, then nothing can be done. And instead, he will soon come to the store, so she must wait. But the main character just screams something, but then covers her mouth with her hand. Tara takes a breath and asks if she would like to see her only garden worker, Shirabi. The girl looks at him in shock, and Yuvlin says that she is drooling, and the main character says that she never thought that she would fall head over heels in love with him. The prince just laughs in response to this. And the main character, now remembering this, 
cannot even raise her face from that table, Yuvlin puts his hand to his forehead and says that in any case, the young lady has sobered up and that's good. After which, she says that she needs to go away for a while, so Shirabi should not create problems. And if she doesn't leave for a regular client, then we can assume that the work is over, but the main character only asks where she's going. The lady with golden hair says that she is going to the palace, and the main character says that the celebration is over. But the girl only says that it seems that the crown prince wants to ask for something, and apparently that is why he specially sent her an invitation. Whether it's a problem with the spirit or something else, he always has something to say. Therefore, the girl stretches and then turns to the main character and pats her on the head, after which she says goodbye. The pink-haired lady just wonders when did the crown prince and emperor become so close to Yevlin. The main character wonders if something really happened between them at the celebration. But suddenly, someone enters the shop and addresses Shirabi. When the main character turns around, she sees a familiar face there. This turns out to be the same night. He says that he is glad to see the lady and asks if he can come in, and also if there is no one else there. The main character looks at him and realizes that she is alone. There was someone else who motivated her to work, but she had completely forgotten about him. The girl understands that the guy came on the eve of the celebration. That day, having finished applying makeup and closing the doors of Shirabi's garden, a voice was heard that was in a hurry to call her, but the young lady completely lost it. Then the guy approached her and claimed that he needed to meet with the owner of this garden. The guy asked if the working day was already over, but the main character only asked what he was talking about. Then the knight, looking at her again, realized that it was Shirabi. He said that he could not believe that this was the lady, and then asked why she looked like that. The young lady asked why, and showed him an invitation to a masquerade ball. The girl asks if the knight knew about this, but he only claims that, to be honest, he was removed from his post, so he is not aware of palace events. The main character doesn't think much about it at first, but then realization dawns on her, and she screams in shock as he is pulled away. Young people understand that palace knights are people who receive the country's salary. That is, civil servants are like an iron rice bowl. The young lady thinks it was possible to refuse the status of an imperial knight. And the purple-haired boy says that there is one more thing he needs to say. And this is that at the moment he is wanted, so he asks if the lady could hide him in her shop for a while. This shocks Shirabi even more. She screams why he is wanted, and then jumps away from him. The girl picks up a shovel and asks if he killed the man. Rosa immediately waves her hands and says that he is not capable of such cruelty. The young lady looks at the sword in its sheath, but the guy says that they are not looking for him because he harmed anyone. He sighs and says that if the girl is so interested, he will tell her, and besides, he has something to tell her. The young lady does not understand what he is talking about and wonders what the former knight of the imperial palace and now a wanted criminal can tell her. So the young lady says that she is busy right now and the guy with purple hair says that then maybe he can come and wait inside. But the young lady only asks whether it is possible to allow visitors into an empty store. Then the young man almost cries and grabs the young lady's leg. He asks if then he can at least wait outside, because he will simply be hiding from there in the garden. Shirabi is ready to refuse him, but when she looks at those puppy dog eyes that are about to cry, who can't say a word. And after that, she remembers everything that the guy did for her, and says that let him do as he wants. Then the knight with purple hair is very happy, and the main character leaves. But after that, a fairy flies up to her and whispers in her ear who he is, and whether this guy is her friend, a visitor, or a thief. Another fairy claims that he scares her, and maybe she should kick him out. The main character claims that he is not her friend, but also not a robber. Shirabi says that she also doesn't quite understand what kind of relationship they have. So she tells the fairies to just watch him so that he doesn't do anything bad. Now the main character understands that he wanted to tell her something. The girl understands that, of course, you listen to what happened, but it's better to tell him right away everything as it is. Therefore, the main character uses her powers, and when the guy approaches one of the plants, who asks what kind of tree it is because he doesn't remember having seen it before. But the young man does not have time to finish speaking when he sees a fairy inside one of the flowers. He turns to the young lady and wants to say something, but when he sees her, he has no other words except admiration. The main character crosses her arms and says that the guy is still there, as she sees a wanted criminal. She sits down at the table and hands the knight a glass of water, after which he says that he hopes that the guy will not carry any nonsense. The young man with purple hair says that this is too much because she hasn't even heard the topic of the conversation yet, 
and she's already reacting like this. He claims that this is not nonsense at all, because we are talking about the duty that the girl carries on her shoulders. The main character immediately jumps up from her chair and asks how he knew. But the knight just smiles and offers to continue, because this story is a little confusing. After which he folds his hands and asks if she is interested. The young lady asks if he is talking about her debt, and the guy agrees. He claims that is what he means. And then you ask what if this same debt is paid in double amount. Shirabi says that this can't be, my boyfriend just says that you should never say never. He gets up from his chair and approaches the main character. He calls her madam, and then you think it would be better to call her boss. The guy asks if she even knows how her parents live now. The young lady thinks this about her parents. Of course she doesn't know because it's obvious. There has been no news from my parents for several years now, and how does Shirabi know about them? However, it is impossible not to find clues if you do everything to find a person. But Shirabi had no intention of actively looking for her parents. Well, if this is so impossible, she has not yet understood why this happened, and maybe it was fate that they let go of her hand on that ill-fated day. But the young lady wonders what if her parents did not abandon her, but instead they settled in the capital of Vetria and earned a name for themselves. The girl thought that, probably, even if they heard about her, it would be too late. But the knight only tells the girl to think about whether people who have lost their daughter can live comfortably without paying their debts. The main character thinks what this means, and then droops. Fairies circle around her and ask if everything is okay, and then they approach the knight and tell him to get out. But Shirabi tells them to wait, and believes that she should find out what the lady thinks. Then the fairies leave the knight alone and fly up to the main character. They ask if it would be better to just kick him out like street vendors, because if Shirabi doesn't like him, then just let him say so, and they will dig a hole for him. The young man with purple hair is struck by this excessive guardianship, and the main character just turns to him and tells him to tell her everything as it is. The girl then claims that she has all the attention. After this, the knight begins his story. He says that he was a spy and a knight of the Verasbi Empire. He was sent to steal the secrets of the Ventrian Empire because the three empires of Verasbi, Ventria, and Zelman do not get along with each other. Then the main character asks why he is in a country like this, but the guy asks how he can know what his superiors are thinking about. But after that, the young lady only says that he said that he would reveal the truth, and asks if he thinks that he revealed it. The guy leans his hand and says that what he said is the main comment. And in fact, of course, he knows the reason. The main character is only angry at his actions. Then the young man with purple hair just waves his hands and asks him to calm down. And then he says that if she acts so rashly with him, then won't she accidentally start a war? The young lady just calmly asks if he can win if a war breaks out, and the guy immediately says no. And he adds that he himself will surrender, but this is not about him and her, but about Virasby and Ventria. The main character is a little shocked by this, and the realization of what is happening comes to her. She says that the guy is funny, and asks what kind of Prince Virasby is he? The guy sighs and says that that's not the point, but their country is a country of knights, so they really value each of them. The young lady just asks if this is a joke, and the young man sighs and realizes that she doesn't trust him. But he says that in any case, Shirabi lent the money and has now honestly admitted it, and thus it seems his boss will trust him at least a little. The guy says that as she already knows, his name is Kale, Kale Bampateria. As the young lady already knows, Kale ben Pateria is a knight of the Verasbi Empire. The guy adds that his age is 22 years old, and he is the deputy head of the delegation of the Fourth Order of Knights of the Verasbi Empire. Shirabi is a little shocked by this information, and the guy immediately spreads his arms and says that it may be difficult to believe that he is the deputy head of the delegation at this age. But it is true. The main character just screams that that's not what she's talking about, and asks if the guy wants to say that such a person is 22 years old. Then the young man understands what she means. He says many people say she also looks young for a 19-year-old. The main character blushes a little and screams that this is all because she is short. After this, the guy says that in any case, they want to take her to the Verasbi Empire. And the reason, of course, is her abilities. But she makes the natural decision. But he is still a knight of his country and is in a position where he must do everything in his power. Now, in this situation, it seems to him that the boss will not listen to whatever he suggests. Therefore, he puts the suitcase on the table and offers to solve the boss's case first. He places a stack of papers on the table and tells the girl to read them. When the main character leafs through it, she is even more surprised with each page. She was wondering what the debt document was, 
but it looked like a copy that recorded not only the total amount, but also when and how much she paid. The guy claims that this is her debt document, and then he takes out another stack of papers from his bag and hands it to the lady with pink hair. He says that this is because her parents were paying off their debts. The young lady understands that if you are not a fool, then you can understand how many years they have been paying a huge amount of money, and the debtor is now being reimbursed for the amount by her parents, who do not even know about this news. Both parties pay double the same amount to the same organization each month. The young man with purple hair claims that whether she believes the contents of the document or not is still up to her to decide. However, now that she knows this information, she is not going to foolishly give up. The young lady just says it's bad. The guy agrees and says that of course it's true, because it costs twice as much money, but the young lady only says that that's not what she's talking about. The young man is surprised by this and doesn't understand what she's talking about then, but the main character only says that she feels bad because he secretly checked her past and feels bad because his eyes look at her like a test, and then says that she feels bad because he suddenly came and started talking about her parents. The young lady says this irritates her so much. The guy is a little puzzled by this. He turns to the young lady and says that it seems that she is too young and therefore does not know much. The main character just slams the table and tells him to look at himself because the milk on his lips hasn't dried yet. The girl asks if he can stop pretending to be an adult when he himself is only 22, or if he thinks that if he's older, that means he's seen a lot. The girl says that no matter how much she wants, she cannot be 100% sure of his words. She says that she will believe him only when he brings her the appropriate evidence. Kael just waves her hands and says that if she so wishes, then she can check for herself whether it is true or not. Then the young lady grabs the documents and says that then she will do as she pleases. And then she tells him not to talk to her, as if she should honor him now. The young man with purple hair understands that this is much more difficult than he thought, but still he has nowhere to go. So he asks how about a mutually beneficial deal, and since he provided her with very significant information, maybe she will then do something for him as a sign of gratitude. But the main character just looks at the pieces of paper and asks what to do with it, and is that all, and then says that she thinks she has nothing more to discuss with them. Well, when she looks at the knight, she sees that he is drooping and does not understand what happened. Then she asks us if he is in pain somewhere. Well, the guy just says that he just got so nervous while running back and forth, and his stomach started to hurt a little. After this, the young lady is in the garden. She touches one of the trees and uses her power. She says that they can try to make something for him out of anything that is already ripe. And with the help of her powers, she grows red berries. The guy also noticed this before, but she really has unusual abilities. The young lady just turns to him. She hands the guy a couple of berries and tells him not to stop spitting them out, but to eat them properly, because in her shop, they are worth like gold. The guy says that just recently, she was ready to kick him out and asks why Shirabi is helping him. But the girl only says that he himself asked how about a mutually beneficial deal, so everything is fair. In return for the information he gave her, she gives him her medicine. The guy says that this is something that is not at all like her, and claims that she is too delicate, after which he swallows the berries that the young lady gave him. Then he looks at his hand and asks if all this turns out to be true what she will do. The young lady just thinks for a moment, and then folds her hands and furiously says that they will need to be taught a lesson. The guy sighs and says that with abilities like hers, she definitely won't need his help, but the young lady only asks him, which he mutters again under his breath. She says that he gave her the information, but she should figure it out entirely on her own. Or did he think that since he's such an adult, he can just come tell everything and run away with his heels sparkling? But the guy only claims that she just asked him to stop pretending to be an adult. The guy sighs and says okay, and in this case, in exchange for his help, he demands an overnight stay. But the young lady says that it is not so simple if he wants to stay there, then he will have to become an employee of her shop. But the place of the flower waterer has already been taken. The knight then asks if she can take him as a mercenary for a while, but the main character claims that she already has one and that she will have better abilities than him. Then the knight asks how he will start hiring him as a handyman. Yeah, the main character says that essentially the duties are the same, and then says that now she thought that he was kind of wanted. The guy is wounded by these words, and says that before that, he was an imperial knight and always wore a helmet, and I don't understand how they drew it, because it doesn't look like him at all, so the girl doesn't have to worry about it at all. Then the young lady agrees, and says that he will deal with everyday issues. 
The young man agrees about the main character and tells him not to even hope for a salary. The fairies whisper among themselves. One says that she understands that the girl is their creator, but she is generally a useless leader, and the other says that, not to mention the fact that she doesn't pay Tara for his work. The main character just turns to the fairies and says furiously, Stop whispering. The Aphelion immediately flies away. What the ranger says, no matter how much he looks at them, he still can't believe it. He claims that he knows that spirits are born in nature, but to think that they so unquestioningly carry out human orders. The young lady understands that the most famous shaman in this world is, of course, Yuvlin. She can calmly control the spirits as if they were her subjects, and the girl is such a unique person that the spirits do not even think about following her orders. However, in Shirabi's case, she is completely different. The girl is not able to indicate or somehow force them. And on the contrary, she's like a real friend to them, because the young lady is a real gardener. The girl collects documents little by little and says that no matter what happens in the world, nothing will surprise her. The young lady heads to the doors and calls out to her handyman. She says that she needs to go check if these documents are true, so she will be gone for a while, and for now he must look after the store. The guy, in shock, asks if he will look after the store, and the main character threatens to tell him to just try to accept a client in her absence and he won't find it enough, after which he leaves. The guy, left alone, thinks how strange Shirabi is, because just recently she was ready to almost pounce on him, and now she left him alone to look after the store. But suddenly the guy hears someone screams, someone calls Shirabi and asks where she is. The stranger cries out that he has one request, and this is a matter of extreme importance, but the fairies who fly near the night say that it is better to do as Shirabi said and not let visitors in. One of the fairies says that when Tara was there, things were going well. The young man understands that even the spirits seem to be accustomed to working with people. He remembers the name Tara, and he understands that apparently the fairies are talking about the prince. The knight thinks it's surprising that Shirabi has so many connections. True, there must be so many of them. She has to be very careful. Otherwise, if the prince suddenly appears there, the public will still stir up, and journalists will still be waiting under the windows. Suddenly, one of the fairies flies up to the guy and asks if he really is a human. But the young man only asks what she is talking about. One of the fairies says that he may be able to deceive Shirabi, but he definitely won't be able to deceive them. Then one of them says that his smell is not at all like a human one. Therefore, the fairy says, is he really a cat person? Kyle is shocked by what he hears. And the fairies just look at each other and say that this is 100% true, and if the young lady finds out, her eyes will probably bulge out of anger. One of them says that maybe it would be better to just run away while there is time, and the other asks why the guy stopped there. The knight only puts his hand to the port and says that he has his own reasons for this. But the fairy only asks if it seems to him that this is not a very ordinary case, and says that so much so that cat people extremely dislike people, but are forced to live with them. The guy folds his hands and says that he needs to find something, he says that nothing will happen if this remains between them, and then asks if they can keep this a secret from Shirabi. After all, looking at how she treats them, the girl does not seem like an evil person, but you never know what to expect from people. The fairies look at each other and then say that they won't tell her, but at least they'll try. But Tara will most likely figure it out, and Shirabi will notice it too, sooner or later. Then the fairy turns to the knight and asks if he can just tell it like it is, and then asks what he is looking for. The young man thinks that he tried in every way to find her, but he never asked the spirits about this, but they probably know about it. In addition, these are plant spirits, and they may well have useful information for him, but they communicate too closely with people, and should he tell them about it. The guy looks at the fairies and thinks that if he continues to constantly fear everything, then perhaps he will not be able to achieve his goal at all, because one way or another their energy has not dimmed one bit. Therefore, the guy raises his head and claims that he is looking for one healing herb. The fairies ask what he is talking about. The young man says that a terrible epidemic has begun in his home village in his homeland, and no one can cope with it. According to the elders, the only thing that can save the villagers is the herb Pemiharis. However, the problem is that it smells nothing and has no taste at all. The guy understands that he could have looked for her somewhere in the forests or among the fields, but even the charm that cat people have did not help in this matter. He and several of his partners decided to move there, taking on human form. Finding themselves among people, the first thing they did was go to the market, buying all possible herbs that could be somehow useful. 
The fairy with pink hair thinks and asks her friend if it seems to her that they have already heard this somewhere, because she definitely remembers that someone talked about it. Then one of the fairies flies up to the knight and asks if he should ask Shirabi about this, because she must know for sure. But the fairy doesn't have time to finish her sentence when Shirabi enters the store. She asks what the guy should ask her for. The young man is a little surprised and asks how she ended up there, but the main character only says that she didn't really hear anything because she had just returned. And then he asks what he wanted to ask for, but he just tries with all his might to show the fairies not to say a word about it. After which he smiles and says that it's nothing like that, and the young lady shouldn't worry about it, because he can cope without her help. Then the young man asks how she went, as well as how everything went, and whether she was able to check the information. The girl says that about this, they said that checking the documents would take about a week. So they can only wait. But then the guy immediately jumps up from his seat and grabs the young lady by the hands. He joyfully cries out if he can stay there, and then continues to ask her. The main character puts her hand on her head and sighs. She realizes that now she also has a handyman under her command. A little time later, the guy is already carrying pots of earth, but suddenly he hears the main character screaming that she will never do this. But the guy just asks my lady how this is. He says that he understands everything, but why are the prices so high all of a sudden? The main character only asks if he says that he understands everything and thinks that she doesn't know at what price her goods are sold. She also asks if it seems too much, since the guy buys plants for only five gold, but sells them for as much as fifteen. Therefore, the young lady asks if he wanted to get rich so much, and says that she seems to have repeated more than once that this variety costs no more than ten gold pieces, and the guy seems not to have heard. Therefore, the main character takes the contract and tears it to shreds. Burka, shocked by this, asks her to wait. The young lady says that this is a violation of the contract, and henceforth their cooperation is over, so the guy can be free. The guy collects the remains of the contract with trembling hands, and then screams at who she thinks he is, but the main character in response screams at who he thinks he is. She says that Mr. Haman himself begged her so much that she even agreed to transfer exclusive rights to trade, but she thinks that they should still accept her proposals. Then the young man asks why she lied at her age, because probably she doesn't know that adults don't act like that. But the main character just turns around and claims that she won't repeat it again, and he knows where the exit is. The guy just clutches the remains of the contract in his hands and says that she will regret it. The main character turns around and asks what he is talking about. But he only says that it seems that her store has begun to rapidly gain momentum, and the additional staff has come in handy. But isn't the young lady afraid that consequences may await her, because making enemies among high-ranking people is a disastrous business? so the little girl should listen carefully. But Shirabi is only angry and wonders if he is trying to threaten her. After all, this usually happens in stores, but her store is not like the others. Therefore, the main character tells him to forgive him. But Mr. Haman is not the only one who is interested in buying exclusive goods, and there is a whole sea of people willing. But in any case, you can just stop selling them. After which, the young lady says that she does not think that this will in any way affect the business of the store. The guy looks at her with an angry look and says that there is no business in the store, but what will happen if something happens to the owner, and how will the store exist without him? Especially if we are talking about a small shop that can only afford two employees. The main character asks what he said, but the guy just turns around and leaves. The knight asks Shirabi if everything is okay, and young Oleg Yuryevich turns around and says that this will take a lot of time. Then she sits down at the table, and Kyle gives her a mug of tea. The guy understands that the girl seems to be out of sorts, and maybe it's because of the documents. There are about two days left before their authenticity is established, so the guy asks what the girl will do. But the lady with pink hair only asks what he is talking about. The knight adds that if the information he gave her turns out to be true, then what will the girl do? The main character then chokes on tea. She says that she gave him medicine and asks if he got sick again. He just sits on a chair and claims that if the young lady wants, then it's not at all difficult for him to finish them off, and the young lady just needs to give a hint. After this, silence hangs between them. The young lady just asks if he's completely crazy and behaves like a real villain. The girl asks how it even occurred to him, and maybe he is wanted not because he is a spy, but because he killed someone. But the young man with purple hair can't help but laugh at this. He says that wouldn't it be easier to just take them and finish them off? Shirabi just says what a psycho he is, but then claims that first impressions can be deceiving. But the guy just continues and asks if there is anything bad in this, 
and why he can't finish off the man who tried to harm her. But the young lady just jumps up and screams for him to stop talking about it, because despite the fact that he is a man and a cat, everything is different with people. The guy is shocked by her words, and the young lady continues and says that you can't just go and say that you'll kill someone, but the young man only asks how she knew. The main character doesn't understand what he's talking about, but the guy only asks once again how she knew that he was not human, while the main character covers her mouth and says that it came out on its own. The young man with purple hair says that it turns out she knew about it and hid it, after which he reaches for his sword and asks if the young lady will also try to sell it like the others did, or even worse, try to take revenge on him for those ill-fated documents. But the lady with pink hair only asks if this is a dream or if the guy is just paranoid. Kyle only asks in surprise what she is talking about, and the main character asks if he thinks that he is the only one who came to her store from hybrids. Of course, you don't often meet cat people in the area, but he is clearly not the first and not the last who visited there. Vitka young lady, elves also came, and even mermaid fairies, who live only in water, and, in addition, she has already met one of the cat people. The guy immediately jumps up from his chair and asks what she's talking about. Well, the main character just calmly asks if he said pemicaris, because that's the name of this herb. The young man only says that she heard everything from the very beginning, but the main character tells him not to win so much because she didn't say that she clearly wouldn't have heard this and whoever talks so loudly in general. But in any case, they have been looking for her for quite some time, because the young man who came to her last time was also looking for her, and she gave her away. The guy, in shock, asks if she says that she gave away that expensive grass. He says that it's not good to lie, because Shirabi is already deeply in debt, and even if he tries, he's unlikely to be able to pay it off. If the young lady manages to return all the stolen money, then perhaps only then will she be able to afford to buy herself at least one root of this herb. However, being completely in debt, she dares to claim that she gave something so dear to someone from their people, but she must understand that among them no one has human money. But the young lady just leans back in her chair and sighs. She asks why she should buy this grass. After which she takes the guy into the garden, and touching the ground in one area, with the help of her powers, grows that same grass. The young lady once again asks why she should buy it if she can simply raise it on her own. The guy is a little shocked. He understands that if you think about it, when it comes to plants, the girl has no equal. Therefore, he only thinks why he didn't notice this before. The main character turns to him and asks if he really thought that she would not have enough abilities to do this only because she was so difficult to get. Shirabi says that cat people often took it in the past, so it should work this time too. But the young man says that he still does not understand why she is helping them because she herself knows very well how expensive this poison is. And if she sold only three or four roots, she could pay off all her debts but the main character just gets up and asks if the guy thinks that she's tired of living. She asks if the guy has thought about what will happen if people suddenly find out that you have three or four roots of medicinal herbs in her store, and moreover, a difficult herb, one that is difficult to find even within the walls of the Imperial Palace. The young lady asks if he thought that some crazy people might try to rob her, and in general the reason why it helps. The girl smiles a little creepily, and then she says that this may sound a little exaggerated, but she, too, tried to satisfy her whims. Then one of the fairies remembered, because the main character, in exchange for that grass, demanded that she touch the guy's ears and tail until she got tired of it. And this cat then lived there for another week. Then the knight with purple hair understands everything. He says only one word. I need to visit. Shirabi turns to him and asks what he means. The guy asks if he can go and visit them. The main role does not ask if he wants to check on the villagers. The young man says yes, and promises that he will definitely return. The lady with pink hair says that she wouldn't care, and if he wants, he can come, and if he wants, he can leave. When the guy leaves, he says that he will return tonight, and then disappears. The young lady is already thinking that apparently he is not particularly bothered by the fact that he is still wanted, because the guy runs around so calmly. She turns around and says that somehow she will take him and drive him out, but from behind she hears someone's voice without getting to know each other, asking who she will kick out. When the young lady turns around, she sees Tara there. The guy says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. The fairies seeing this just fly away and tell them to have a good time. The main character, all red, asks what time it is. She screams for the fairies to come back quickly, but they are not even going to do this. 
The prince only asks if he can come in, after which they head inside the store. The young man looks back and says that not much time has passed since his last visit, but it seems to him that an eternity has passed, after which he looks at one of the trees and says that it has grown. Then he is greeted with the fairies, and after that he sits on a chair. But when he does this, something like wool flies into the air. The prince wonders if this is cat fur, and then she sneezes. The main character remembers that the guy is allergic to cats. The young man asks if she got a cat. Yeah, the main burning says that he's not really, and it's a long story. But in short, a cat man came there. After this, the young lady heads to the door and offers to go out, and the fairies begin to open the windows. After this, the main character and the prince sit in the garden. The girl says that even if the prince has time to come here, then is Yuvelin really that busy? The guy just asks in surprise if Shirabi heard, because he thought she knew. Tara only says that one very important matter came up, so Evelyn and his brother went outside the empire. The main character only asks in shock if they left, because the girl didn't tell her anything like that. But when the young lady met the prince, she said that Shirabi was unlikely to be particularly interested in such things. The main character is a little angry at her friend, and the guy asks if she remembers the garden on the estate that she revived then. The young lady says she remembers, but what about Togo? Tara says it was shortly after their first meeting, and the two went to explore. The young lady asks how they will do it, and the guy replies that they said that if a girl can use spirits, then she can also see memories from the past. And his brother wants to find the person responsible for the arson. Shirabi realizes that the two went through a lot as children. The young lady looks at him and realizes that they have survived so many attempts on their lives. The young man turns around and smiles at the young lady, blushing a little. Shirabi Toad realizes that the two have now grown up and become imperial princes. Therefore, they have the power to catch the culprit. The girl says that it turns out that these two are busy with really serious matters. She feels terrible because she can't help. But the prince tries to calm Shirabi down and tells her not to worry because he wouldn't want her to go with them anyway. He sees that the main character is a little unsteady, so he pulls her closer to him. He claims that this case is much more dangerous than she thinks, but he sees that Shirabi is only leaning on him with her eyes closed. Therefore, the guy looks away and thinks that there is nothing left. Well, then the main character opens her eyes and asks what he is thinking about. The guy is a little taken by surprise by this and says that he doesn't think about anything like that. And then All Red turns around and says that the trail just disappeared so quickly. The main character asks what he is talking about, and then she remembers those events at the ball and immediately blushes all over. She jumps away from the prince so that she overturns the plate of cookies. The girl screams, what is he saying? But the young man only says that since everything is past, he can leave one more mark. The main character is already in complete shock from this and is all red as a tomato. But the guy just continues and says that then she will remember him every time she looks at her. The young lady is shocked by this. She immediately hides behind a tree and screams what is wrong with him and whether the prince is crazy. She asks if it's something in the air or if he's just gone crazy. But the young man only gets up from his seat and comes closer to Shirabi. He claims that when the time comes, he will come to see her and maybe at the same time help with something like before. The main character looks at him incredulously, but the guy just says that she must have a lot to do because he was her only employee, so she probably needs help. For example, to move large pots or heavy boxes. Shirabi says that if that's what he's talking about, then everything is fine. The young man asks what she's talking about. The main character thinks about how to explain everything and then says that she seems to have an assistant, but the prince only asks what she is talking about because she has no employees. Shirabi says that he is not really an employee, and this is connected with her collector, so everything is complicated. The prince asks which collector and why she didn't say everything right away, but the main character claims that she is saying it now. But the prince only comes up to her and grabs her by the shoulders. He says that the girl could have told her earlier. She could come or send a spirit because there are a lot of different ways. The young lady turns to Tara. She asks if he decided to interrogate her. That same evening, the girl is sweeping the ground in her garden. She thinks that one and the other guy are both idiots. Fairies fly up to the main character. One of them points to the store and says that Tara still hasn't left, then asks if she's going to ask him. The young lady says she doesn't know, but then a shadow approaches her from behind. The main character does not understand who it is. But when he turns around, he sees that same guy and several big guys. She understands that these people definitely didn't come there for the trees, and they are clearly planning something wrong. 
one of them approaches the main character and asks what will change if he tells who he is. The lady with pink hair realizes that this is a familiar voice, and then he realizes that this is exactly the man who was in her this morning. The girl asks who knows. She asks why they are here and tries to step back. But when she does this, she realizes that there are two more men behind her. The young lady understands that this place is very far from the main roads and shops, so she does not think that she will be able to escape. But no one will hear her, not even Tara, because he is too deep in the shop. But the young lady's mouth is immediately closed, and she is stuffed into a bag. The fairies fly up to her, and the main character screams for her to gather everyone and bring help. The kidnappers are just wondering if everyone is at home, and one of them asks who she is chatting with. Tara is at this time near the bench, he sighs. But at the same moment, fairies fly up to him and claim that Shirabi is in big trouble. The guy asks what happened, and the fairy replies that she was stolen. Then someone from the outside asks if this is serious. The guy says that he can't leave for a second, he comes closer to the prince. And then he says that with Shirabi every day is fun, and that's for sure. The guy puts his hand on his head and hides his ears. The prince says that this is Verkot, and then claims that he is the same wanted knight. The young man sighs and then tells him to let him clear something up. Varya claims that he is exactly that knight, but he is not a bad guy. The prince only says that the criminal said otherwise, but Kyle tells him to relax. After all, he may have been a spy, but he hardly had any valuable information, and he was planning to leave the ranks of the Velawis knights. But the prince asks why he should believe this. Kale points to the shop and says that at least because he is an errand boy in this store. Tara says that's what Shirabi was talking about. The young man agrees and says that he is the golden assistant of the big boss, and now he is in her debt. And therefore, for now he has no intention of leaving there, but then he asks his highness whether he can continue to chill there. He adds that Shirabi was kidnapped. The prince claims that this is true and that she must be saved. But his interlocutor only asks what exactly he is going to do because he knows that he has no attacking abilities and he doesn't handle the sword well. Therefore, if he goes after her alone, he will bring even more problems. The prince is shocked by this and asks what the knight is talking about, but he only claims that the young man has little time. This means he doesn't have time to call his knights, so he offers to make a deal. Tara asks what kind of deal he is talking about, and Kyle says that he will help him, because in the end, he was a real knight and would even say that he handles the ball better than others. The prince thinks for a minute. He thinks how difficult it is for Shirabi now, so he asks what his interlocutor wants, but he only says that he should remove the reward from his head for his help in saving Shirabi, after which the young man says that this is a simple request. The prince understands that, of course, the bounty on his head is just a precautionary measure because, after all, his identity was identified later, but they have no information about what information he collected on them, and if he does everything correctly, then this request will really be easy to fulfill. The prince says that if the guy has not committed other crimes, then he will consider his offer. But Kale, he just tilts his head and asks if he gives him any guarantees. But then he turns around and says, okay, he'll do it, and then turns to the spirits and asks if they know who stole it. The fairies claim that they do not know the names, but one of them looked like a person who came to the shop before quite recently. Well then, realization comes to the fairy, and she realizes that she recognized his voice, because this is the person with whom Shirabi literally broke the contract. Then the guy remembers that it happened this morning, and the girl apparently has no instinct of self-preservation. He claims that he knew that something like this could happen, and it is not surprising that she was kidnapped. But the store doesn't even have a gate, but the guy thinks when she was careful, because he only gained her trust and was able to gain freedom of action in the store. She even allowed him to stay there. One of the fairies says to follow her, after which Kyle goes after her and tells his highness to follow him too. But the guy just follows his interlocutor and asks if it's possible not to call him that. But he just turns to him, and then he picks him up and talks about how slow his highness is. Tara is shocked by this, and Kyle immediately jumps over the fence. The main character is in one of the houses at this time. She sits on the floor with her mouth tied. One of the fairies tries to untangle the woozle and freeze the main character's mouth. The young lady asks why this happened just when Yovlin was away. Shirabi turns around, looking around the room. The fairy with purple hair says that the other fairies went for help and the girl should not worry. The main character just sighs and says that she hopes this help will not be Tara. The girl then looks at the door and asks if there is anyone outside. Then the fairy flies to check. When he flies out, he sees that some people are talking there. 
The fairy notices that she knows one of them, and the young lady says it's one of those idiots who stopped by this morning. But the fairy says that she does not mean him, because the man she saw is a collector, a man who comes for their money. Then Shirabi remembers that sneaky bastard. Now she remembered everything. After all, it was he who introduced her to that Haman guild. This happened shortly after the girl arrived in the capital. After all, when the debt reached 6,000 gold, that man came to the girl who had obvious problems with payments and offered a deal. The guy claimed that if she gave him sole rights to sell, he would forgive her 100 gold pieces. When Shirabi first opened the store, there were days when the profit was less than one gold, so she gave in and accepted the offer with tears in her eyes. Now the lady with pink hair understands that if you think about it, it was a real scam, and apparently they found out about it, but all these merchant informants are worthless. But then the girl looks at the door and wonders whether Eli can be trusted, because voices are almost inaudible. The main character looks at the window and realizes that this, apparently, is the only way to escape. But then the doors to the room open, and the main character falls from this. This turns out to be the same person. He enters the room and tells the young lady that it is useless to try to escape. He says that she has accumulated a considerable debt, and then asks if it's true. Shirabi is ready to finish him off right there, but they decide to calm down because his people are standing outside the door, and therefore it is dangerous to make a fuss. But the man only approaches her and says that she has nothing to worry about because putting girls into eternal sleep is not among their hobbies. In addition, she has a rather close connection with the Imperial Palace, after which that grandfather says that he called there a person capable of erasing memory, so for now, the girl should just sit there. The main character looks angrily at this freak, and he only says that the look alone is frightening, but then a scream is heard from the corridor. Then that freak turns around and asks what happened. The guy guarding the entrance says that there is someone outside and we need to check. Then that man comes out and tells the girl to relax because he will be back soon, and then leaves, slamming the doors. Shirabi is already terribly enraged. She already seems to be burning with anger, but then she looks at the fairy, and he asks her to untie it. But when the little girl with purple hair tries to do it, she says that the knot is too tight and won't come undone. The young lady understands that there is no other choice, and she needs to try until she succeeds. The main character thinks if only she could free her hands. Then the girl tries with all her might to do this, but unfortunately, it doesn't work out very well for her. At this time, Kyle is still dragging the prince on himself. The same one screams that he can walk on his own, so the guy can let him go. But Kyle just says, what a shame, and then asks, isn't it faster, and his highness still won't be able to catch up with him, no matter how fast he runs. Tara screams that he can get there on a horse, otherwise this situation is no good. But Kyle tells him to just relax because they are almost there, and then he asks if the guy is even going to save the boss. Then the prince falls silent. He understands that this is the main task. Kyle says there are no objections so they can continue. But Tara only says that manipulating someone in such a weak spot is such meanness. But Kyle only asks what kind of relationship his highness has with the boss. The guy and Genya will think a lot. And then, a little wilted, he says, what if this can even be called a relationship? One of the fairies flies near them and turns to the other. She asks if they are talking about a relationship after saving Shirabi, and the other only asks if she didn't feel that something was in the air between them. The guy turns all red from such conversations. He doesn't understand what they mean by being sorry. Kale just smirks, and then they finally get to where Shirabi appears to be sitting. The prince feels dizzy, and Kyle lowers him to the ground. When the guy gets up, Kale says that Shirabi is not bad because she grabbed such a guy, but the fairy says that more precisely, it is Tara who is possessed by Shirabi. Kyle remembers this girl and asks if this is true, but the fairy only says that he constantly annoys her. Then the guy with purple hair asks if he can help and tells Phoenix to consider it a mutual favor. The golden-haired little girl realizes that mutual means that she will need to repay him for his help, so she wonders if this is a good idea, but then turns around and nods in agreement. Meanwhile, the purple-haired fairy tries to untie the knots in Shirabi's arms. She almost succeeds, so the young lady says that he's great there and is doing a great job, but at this pace they will soon finish. But the young lady hears some voices from the street. One of them tells the others to make sure she drinks two glasses of water before they start erasing her memory. Shirabi understands that they are already there, but she understands that she cannot just give up. The fairy is trying with all her might to untie these knots, and she finally succeeds. But it turns out to be a little too late to believe. Those same guys come into the room, 
One of them approaches the main character and asks if she heard everything, after which the guy approaches her and claims that before he erases her memory, he needs answers to some questions. He says that the girl grew up without parents, and it must be hard to hear about her debts. Well, he asks how she knew that the debt was paid in double amount. The lady with pink hair curses this damn information, but the guy tells her to answer otherwise it will be bad, and he wouldn't want to lay a hand on the girl. Shirabi realizes that if she talks about Kyle, he will be in danger. Therefore, the girl only turns to this villain and asks if he will hit her if she does not answer. The guy says that then there will be no other choice. Ah, uh, the main character says that the person who told about this. But then she suddenly becomes silent and asks what to do. The girl apologizes and claims that her memory is so bad. The young man becomes furious at this. He stuffs the dagger back into its sheath and says that he said that he doesn't enjoy beating girls. But the main character only says with a smile on her face that this is good, and she doesn't enjoy giving up her people in exchange for her life. Then the guy immediately gives her a strong slap in the face, which makes the young lady's vision swim, and the guy just grabs her by the collar and asks if she's going to answer. He then takes out his dagger again and folds it and charges at Shirabi with it. But suddenly, a wind with herbs blows from the window. The villain does not understand what is happening, but he is immediately enveloped by a vine. When the main character opens her eyes, she sees fairies in front of her. They are very hostile towards that guy. The young man asks what it is. He uses a knife to try to free himself from this vine, and one of the fairies screams that if he touches Shirabi, she will finish him off. The lady with pink hair notices a small, dark energy coming from the fairy. She also says that if that guy hurts Shirabi again, she will not forgive him. The main character remembers the spirit from the rotten tree so she raises her hand and claims that she is fine and asks the fairies to stop. The guy just turns around and asks if this is her doing. He tries with all his might to free himself from the vine, and he succeeds. After that, he grabs the sheath of the dagger and screams that he left the girl alive, and she does the same to him. He swings at her with all his might, but suddenly, someone grabs his hand. This guy claims that they say that people who can manipulate the memories of others are much more sensitive, so he decides to check if this is true. When the villain turns around, he sees a guy with purple hair there, but he begins to squeeze his hand so tightly that the scabbard falls out of the villain's hands. Kyle just asks with a smile on her face if the guy wanted to hit her boss, but the memory manipulator falls to the ground and screams in pain. The main character is still floating before her eyes. Someone covers her and puts a hand on her face, blocking her entire view. The main character thinks that this man's hand smells so nice, and it's the smell of herbs. So the girl asks Tara if it is. The young man with the ears only tells the boss not to open his eyes, because it won't be the most pleasant sight. And then he unsheaths his sword, and says he'll take care of this guy. Then he turns to the villain, and says that he dared to hit his boss, so that he will make him suffer and regret his actions. 